Hello and welcome to the 2014 Touring Pro Series Virtual Mini Challenge, Round 5 from Cascavel. Inside SimRacing.tv, the fastest show on the internet. Sim racing news and reviews since 2007, with new shows every week. Hello everybody and welcome to this, the fifth and penultimate round of the 2014 Touring Pro Series Virtual Mini Challenge. We arrive back on the shores of Brazil to run here at Cascavel. Uh, to give it its proper name, the Autodroma Internacional de Cascavel. Well, an automobile racing complex located on the shores of Highway BR277 in the city of Cascavel in Parana in Brazil. 3.032 kilometers in length, a paved circuit. Uh, has held races back in its streets since the 1960s with amateurs racing on here. But of course, these guys know amateurs. These are the best of the best when it comes to racing in front-wheel drive Mini Coopers. And they are, of course, battling it out for the championship. And in a season where it has been uh, walk racing, almost taking a stroll towards the title, Jesper Tolborg has been the cat amongst the pigeons. And he really has been putting himself amongst it. Uh, and he currently leads the championship going into this penultimate round. I'm Scott Woodwiss, and once again alongside me for expert analysis is a former BTM champion and also track record holder here in this class at Cascavel. It is, of course, Robert Beeson with it. Rob, great to have you back with me once again. And Cascavel as a circuit, of course, you've won here before a couple of times uh, in Season 2 of the Minis. So effectively, this circuit here, it ha looks, looks like a fairly simple layout, but as I'm sure as you've experienced, it's a pretty tricky one at that. Hello, Scott. Hello, everyone. This is certainly not an easy track. It's very short, but it's very challenging. There's a lot of elevation changes, some really, um, you know, flowing corners. But you have to position your car right to get the lines right. You have to put your tire pressures exactly right so they um, they last the whole race because many corners are going the same direction. This is definitely not easy for the drivers at all. Well, of course, uh, one championship which is also running parallel to the, the Clio series to the virtual minutes, it is in fact the clears, and we'll start off with the standings currently there because we have to apologise that there haven't been any broadcasts. There's some logistical issues in terms of scheduling have prevented us from providing you coverage of the clears, but we will give you uh, the latest standings coming into the Plantsnet round, which is happening next week at this very circuit in Cascavel. So moving forward, we can show you now. This is how it stands. And of course, Rob, of course, you've raced. You're currently racing in the championship, so you can tell us exactly what's going on. So here's the drivers' championship. Hack leads it. But uh, it's not exactly been plain sailing for Hack because he's been in a quite a titanic fight with Larrison going forwards. And these guys have been on and off missing rounds. Yeah, um, actually, at the last round at Poznan, Alexander Lauritsen, who's been leading the championship until this point, he has not been racing because he's been testing real cars in Sweden. You know, he's racing in the Volkswagen Shiroko Cup at the moment, so he has got uh, some real racing commitment. He couldn't drive. And Chris Hack, you know, almost made the most of it, but in the end it was Adrian Holm who won both races at Poznan, his THR teammate. And Hack finished second in both races and um, maybe lost a little bit of ground because the problem for him is that he will actually miss the next round at Cascawell. So Lauritsen has a big chance to catch up again. And then, um, actually, after Cascawell, there's only one round left of this championship. There will only be the round that, um, at Thraxton left, the season finale. And if Lauritsen does um, as expected and gets a few podiums out there, he will he can gain a maximum of 60 points. So he can take back the lead of the championship. But it will actually be really close. Um, speaking about the last, last round at Poznan, there were a couple of small surprises as well, you know. Um, lots of drivers have been improving throughout the season. We've got uh, Andy van der Felde, for example, qualifying in third position for the first race. It's definitely his best qualifying performance he's ever had in TPS. Then we had uh, Jimmy Hughes finishing in fourth position, I think, in the second race, getting his best career TPS result. So, you know, lots of guys um, getting good results. I got two podiums out of this event, so it went pretty well. Yeah, and um, in uh, pretty much one week, actually one day less, you know, it's on Monday next week, this series comes to uh, Cascavel again for the penultimate round. It certainly does. And we'll quickly move across here to show you the team standings as well 
to give you the full outlet if this uh, screen will move any faster. It will do just about. There we go. So you should be able to see the team standings right now. It's just cutting off the view for team there. There we go. That's much better in the centre. Uh, so here, it, as it stands, of course, there, and it's pretty close in the team standings as well. I didn't realise it was that close. Uh, Rob, three points separating THR Orange and THR Red. But Optum Sim Racing Alpha, if they have a good weekend here in Cascaville and also the final round in Thruxton, they can certainly get amongst it. And if THR Red find themselves in trouble, why not necessarily have THR teams first and second, might we? Yeah, of course, Chris Hack is missing the round, so Teacher Orange will have only one car out there in the next event. So this is a brilliant opportunity for Optimum Sim Racing, and um, both uh, Ryan Walker and Matteo Aban certainly have been on the pace the whole season. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure they can maybe get a second place in the championship, but you know, it's it's very close. Teacher Red surely is the favourites in the team standings, even though they're in second place right now. But there have been quite a few surprises. Also, Core Racing, for example, with Thomas Erzen and Rod Powell. They've had a brilliant season in fourth place there. Well, that's the that's the standings of the course, and we'll give you out information of that, of course, at the final round uh, of the minis back in Thruxton. Uh, that, of course, covers what's happening over in the Clio, just to inform anyone who has possibly missed out on it. Uh, in terms of the actual mini championship, we're going to bring, show you the standings right now for the minis as it goes forward. And this is exactly how it, the, the, the drivers' standings look coming into the penultimate round. And it's Jesper Tolborg, who have basically leased the championship without a single race victory this season because they have gone all the way of the two guys right on his tail in the standings. It's Adrian Kempfield second and Paul Patrick in third place, but uh, it's quite intriguing. As you said, it's we are this is this, this is this is the penultimate round of the series uh, due to some should we say unforeseen circumstances. Uh, we've had to cut the series short um, to just six six rounds. So the last event will be in a couple of weeks' time at the, the Holy Grail, the centrepiece event of any championship, it seems, uh, in TPS that is Thruxton. Everyone wants to win there. It's our equivalent of Monaco. Uh, because, uh, of course, you know, IndyCar Racing has Indy. You know, NASCAR has Daytona. F1 has Monaco. And we have Thruxton, because everyone wants to win there. Uh, so, Talbot has 188 points compared to 182 for Campfield and 176 for Paul Patrick. But, obviously, looking at the practice time so far, Rob, Jesper hasn't really been on the pace. And, We've seen some, some quite stunning laps already from both Adrian and Paul so far. So, yes, but even though he leads the championship coming into this plantsport race here at Cascavel, he's going to have his work cut out to kit to stop these two walk racing cars, especially with the form they're showing here at this racetrack. Yes, but hasn't really been on the pace throughout the whole season, maybe with the exception of Zolder. But, um, with, you know, with the decision that the championship is uh, cut short to six event, Jesper has all of a sudden been put into a position where he can win the championship. And both Kempfield and Patrick had some really bad events. So, um, you know, Jesper, all of a sudden, he finds himself in the lead of a championship once again where he hasn't won a race, like <laughs> like last time out in VTM, for example, where he ended up winning the championship without a win, uh, without a race win. But uh, the thing is, it's still two rounds to go, so four races, and Kempfield and Patrick, they are they are certainly putting in the laps. You know, they're doing the practice. I'm not sure how how fast Torwalk is because of the practice times. He didn't look too quick. But, you know, THR, they've, they've seen their chance. They brought back Chris Butcher as Torvok's teammate. So maybe they can, you know, they can win this championship a bit unexpectedly. Of course, Butcher, of course, has been chasing a TPS championship for so long. But once again, he will play a supporting role to Jesper this time. But, of course, I'm sure he's only t uh, two curses to do so. Uh, in fact, to make sure that THR do secure... Uh, another championship here at Touring Pro Series, or is it going to be Walk Racing securing one of their first ever in their history in this league? Well, that's the standings, of course. Let's have a quick look, of course, going forwards uh, to any other events before we get out onto the track. And, of course, the one event we've been talking about uh, at length, uh, especially last venue, is, of course, the Virtual Touring Masters. Now, this is a championship, of course, that's going back to a classic format, uh, which we saw back uh, based on Season 2. Um, we, we're re revisiting the fantastic Touring Car Legends mod, the, the glory days of uh, Group A Touring Cars with circuits such as Spa, Francochamp, Suzuka, Laguna Seca, Brands Hatch, Trois Rivière, and of course the season finale at the awesome Mount Panorama. And speaking of Mount Panorama, it's a circuit that hasn't been too kind to one Toby Davis, and as you can see on the right hand side, uh, the S's have been named the Davis S's. Now, not necessarily because of a good thing because Davis has won here, but more what he's lost here rather than what he's won because on three separate occasions on his visits to uh, Bathurst here, Rob, these, this very corner has um, has claimed his championship charge, including, quite infamously, that season where he had uh, some Fanta bottle caps to blame. Yeah, um, I mean, Toby Davis, he's been racing in these cars for 
for quite a while, since the first season, actually, he's always been in the same Force area and he's always been looking quick and had a chance at, you know, at least winning races. And in, the, in season three, he definitely had a chance at winning the championship. <laughs> and, you know, in this corner, every time it went wrong, it went completely wrong. In season three, it was probably the most, uh, you know, most prominent uh, crash that he had when he actually put some Fanta caps below his chair. So, um, because he didn't like that, I think he didn't like the wheels under his chair, and his chair was always moving. So, he replaced it with the bottle caps, and then that construction wasn't really strong enough, and it all fell apart exactly in this corner, and he crashed, and the title went to Torborg. Well, we will not hope that uh, that it happens again, so Ryan put a little warning sign for Toby onto the barrier, that he always remembers what, what happened here. Let's see how that goes. So we'll never be able to live it down now. The fact that that corner is claimed so many times. He will have a score to settle with that racetrack when he gets to the final round uh, at the end of the season. Sign-ups for that championship, if you're interested in taking part, finish on the 19th of this month. So on the 19th, which is going to be, if I look correctly, that's going to be uh, next Thursday. So if you haven't got your entry in by then, you will not be there. And get it, get it in fast, because we have had over 40 entries for this championship. So just proves just how popular the Virtual Touring Masters are, especially with these Group A Touring cars. It is going to be an absolute right, I can tell you. First race is going to be on the 25th of June at the awesome spa franco Champs circuit on, I believe, the historic 1988 layout. So, uh, so that should be a fantastic spectacle to watch. Don't miss it. You'd be a fool if you did. Right, cars are out on track now, currently qualifying, and as you'd expect, it is Adrian Campford, who is top of the times with a 114.4, uh, with Paul Patrick in second place, 114.709. He's then followed by his teammate Ryan Callan in third place, and quite frankly at the moment, Robert, is uh, another uh, walk racing whitewash at the moment in the top four, but uh, best of the rest in fifth position, impressing once again on a virtual, virtual mini challenge weekend, is Jonathan Osserklint, he's up there in fifth. Yeah, this track has always been good for Ockerklint. He's been um, quite close to the front already in Season 2 and 3 here. As we just see Chris Butcher moving up to second. Chris Butcher certainly is on the pace here. He's won both races last season at, uh, at this track. So, um, yeah, it's good to have him back in the championship. And hopefully he can he can really challenge the walk racing guys. This is a circuit that Chris Butcher is uh, no stranger to. In fact, he uh, did taste success here in the 2013-2014 season. That was season... Uh, three of the minis uh, where he won both races and so he definitely knows what it takes to uh, may take a victory around this circuit and he's definitely on the pace as you see the number two machine Optimus Sim Racing car bounding along the grass to keep himself out of the way but Butcher is certainly showing some great paces Campbell is going faster by merely a thousandth of a second on his top time uh, Paul Patrick third Peter Hennenberg is up to four which means that he has uh, jumped Ryan Callan in the Group positions at the moment in fifth. John Osclin is sixth on a personal best. Uh, rounding out the top ten, Luis Fernandez in seventh place, uh, followed by Matty Orban in eighth. As Fernandez gets it very wrong and uh, understeers wide onto the astro onto the uh, concrete tarmac. Uh, that makes no sense. <laughs> and you've got Ryan Walker up to seventh. Great lap from Ryan Walker to uh, get us back into the top ten. A very capable uh, sim racer from Scotland, of course, and continuing his craft. As Tolborg uh, displaces him immediately. He's up to 7th, but just lacking pace at this circuit here. And I wonder, possibly, Rob, is the fact that, not, not necessarily the pressure of having to hold on to a championship lead, but the fact that maybe it is a circuit that doesn't really suit both, both him and the car together as, as one, really. And it's not really a circuit that suits his driving style either. Well, on this circuit, you probably need a bit um, of a specific driving style because of the way that the corners are. And the track is not flat. You know, actually, I'm a bit surprised that Torwalk is so slow because usually he's one of the drivers who can drive every car on every track and he's always fast. But certainly it, uh, it doesn't really seem to work for him at the moment. Not the setup, I assume, because Butcher is right on the pace. But yeah, he's got some work to do if he wants to win this championship. Did Diego Silva pop up to fifth position for GT Competizione? Very fast Portuguese and immediately puts it into a tail slide through turn one. They are quite fun little things to oversteer if you get, if you get the opportunity to. Uh, Butcher has gone even quicker, and he is only uh, fractions away from Campfield's pole time. Walker up to third with a brilliant lap time of a 114.648 to go best of the rest and to displace the uh, walk racing cars going forwards. Paul Patrick fourth. Klaus Nearing is up to fifth with Henneberg in sixth. So, again, the walk racing cars definitely showing their prowess at the front of the field. But it's great to see a few names actually getting up there and mixing it in there. Two of the GT Competizione cars up in the top ten. 
or at least it was, but it's now been, dis now been just moved around a little bit more. It's Callum's back up to 8th, Oscar Clint's ninth, and now rounding out the top 10 is Patalborg. So it's good to see that it is a n nice little mixture of THR and Walk Racing with a few unexpected names in there for good measure as well, Rob. Yeah, Optimum Sim Racing, they've been having such a good season so far. And it's also good to see that it's this time Ryan Walker who's at the front, because um, in the last race it looked like he was a little bit behind his, uh, his teammates, Orban and Ockerklin, but he's certainly on the pace here. And for Torborg, he definitely has some work to do here if he wants to stay in a championship hunt. Because 10th place is not so easy to overtake on this track, and he certainly has some fast riders ahead of him. So, um, yeah. It would be good for him if he could improve his time a little bit, because actually the gap is pretty big. It's almost half a second that he's behind Adrian Kempfield at the moment. As Ryan Cannon then comes back onto the uh, pit straight to start another lap, then let's just to just rob a course. Um, when he talks to a lap here in this circuit, because it is, but he's not on the pit straight. My apologies. So as he comes, as he comes back on towards the uh, the start and finish straight towards the final corner, uh, Rob, just talk us through a lap here for of the Cascavel and talk us through the challenges and what it takes to uh, be successful on this circuit. All right, we're coming up to the start and finish straight now. Our Cullen runs right there. You go through this corner actually in fourth gear, and you try to take a lot of momentum through the corner. And you're coming up to the first corner here, which is a very, very long left-hander. Lift down to uh, to fourth gear again. You can't really hit the first apex. You need to get the car to get close to the second apex. That's the most important thing. Cullen runs a bit wide, but I don't think that was a very good first sector. Now it's a very fast left-hander that goes downhill, and it will unsettle your car, especially if you're running very high rear tire pressures. And then right into a right center, which you take a very narrow line into, and Cullen abandons this lap. It was not a very good first sector from him, but here's Diogo Silva, who's just been at the same position, so we continue. Um, there we have it, this corner. Silva takes a much more um, comfortable line through the corner. Takes a lot of speed through the corner. Next, uh, next bit is flat, this right hander here. And then you come into the really tricky left hander, which goes up the hill, and your car was understeer away from the apex here. And it's hard to get the right turn in point. He doesn't quite hit the apex, but he isn't also so far away either. And then another left hander, which is a bit slower. You go over the curb here. You can run wide over the curb on the exit as well. Some people don't do that, but it's, um, it's very tricky. Now you, this is actually the long straight on the track. Now you need to um, be early in the throttle out in the last corner. And this corner is very fast and very tricky, especially because you've got some nasty anti cuts on the outside. You go in fourth gear through this corner and just try to hit the undercuts a little bit too much as Paul Patrick goes on pole position. Staggering lap from Paul Patrick as he puts it to the top of the times. 114.468. Look at how close it is. Butcher is also going relatively quickly as well. And he's actually oh, up on in lap. sector two. This is a great lap here. Some dust has been kicked up in the foreground uh, from somebody in front. But now as he comes down towards that final corner we talked about, that run in onto the pit straight which is so crucial to watch the anti-cuts on the outside Butcher just c cresting the rise and he will throw this mini into the final corner a bit of tyre smoke as he heads now back towards the pit straight and is it going to be good oh enough that's that very conservative that's well, very conservative could have been. across the line he comes is it going to be pole position no it's not 114.517 not his best lap time uh, and that is it for qualifying flag is out so there will be no more times anyone else who's on a lap is allowed to finish it but uh, apart from that, anyone who who cannot improve on their laps, that is the you done for the session. A class nearing everyone is uh, no one else is really on our time. Well, Diego Silva is he's currently in seventh. We'll see if he can improve at all. He's not on a personal best at the moment in the number 48 machine. He brings it down towards the final corner. Also ten behind is uh, one of the Mad Kate racing cars, as well as he heads back of the pit straight. These two do use the anti cuts on the outside, and D D Silva will sprint from the line. Let's see where this time puts him. Keeps him seventh. One, one for fourteen point eight five six. Literally four, that merely four thousandths of a second off his personal best. So, that shows rock solid consistency in the setup for this number forty eight machine, and he will start firmly inside the top ten on row four alongside Ryan Callan. So, not very many other people out there uh, setting lap times. I mean, we've got a very and what's intriguing also is that we do have a very small grid for this race here, Rob. Nineteen cars. So. I don't think traffic's on such a small circuit. It does mean that traffic isn't going to play so much of a part in terms of being a dominating factor, but it'll certainly mean that uh, these guys will be able to battle amongst each other. But it does also mean it have an increased risk factor of the of the field being equally sp uh, fairly spread out, which could possibly deplete from the racing action if they if some drivers do get a chance to run away with it with a gap. Well, actually, the, the times in qualifying they they were all very competitive. The car that qualified last was not even a second behind the Pullman. 
So, um, that's good. It's good to see, you know, there are not so many drivers, but all these drivers that are left in the series, they're very capable. And I think we had uh, the Cavallo, and um, who was the other one on the, on the final row? I think Hexen. The two really capable drivers, you know, the Cavallo, he's got a top five in the Clios, for example. Um, John Monroe back there, he's a race winner in TPS. So these drivers, they are certainly, they are certainly good. It's just that this field has not so many drivers, but all the drivers are on a very high level. Well, let's take a very quick look at how they're going to line up, of course, looking at that top 10 what, that we have. Uh, of course, the front few rows are dominated by Walk Racing. Patrick and Campford on row one. Butcher's managed to put a very uh, pleasantly surprising row two. Chris Butcher and Ryan Walker up there with uh, Klaus Neuring and Peter Hennenberg in row three. Diogo Silva and Ryan Callum making up row four with Oscar Klintz and uh, Jesper Tolbock in row five as one of the walk racing cars takes a bit of, does a bit of uh, dirt tracking across the inside of the circuit. That's not the proper line and kicks up a, a ton of red red dust in the process. Thanks for that. Uh, but with three minutes left to go and warm up looking at the rest of the, rest of the, rest of the field. Um, is there anyone on there that you've seen through this grid? Obviously apart from, of course, Haxton and De Carvalho near, near the back of the grid. They are going to be ones to watch but is there really anyone in that in that qualifying order who is out of position and not exactly where you'd expect them to be? Uh, first of all, I don't find it really surprising that Chris Butcher is third. He's been um, he's the guy with the most race wins in this series, and in every season he's been at the front, and every season he's won races so far. And um, I think this just shows how good Chris Butcher really is, and he missed out on a big opportunity, I've, I think, in this league. He could have won the title, yeah, or at least challenged for it, if he would have done all races. So, uh, I'm not surprised by him. The only one that I'm really surprised um, about is Jesper Torvog, who's only in 10th position, because he certainly needs to do more if he wants to win the title. He can't really rely on the walk racing guys making mistakes. I mean, this happened last time, but I'm, I'm sure they will have learned from their mistakes, and now they will try to drive a consistent race. They can even let Butcher win. If Torvog stays so far back, they will make up the gap. And what I find really interesting to see, though, is if Patrick and Kemp will now finally battle against each other. Or if they try to, you know, concentrate on one of them and try to promote the championship. But I haven't seen them drafting, for example, in qualifying, so it's a bit hard to say how it's going to play out. It is an interesting dynamic that we have to watch out for these final two races, isn't it? To see exactly how uh, Paul Patrick and Adrian Campford are going to uh, are going to treat each other on the racetrack. Because, of course, they are firm teammates. They are in the same uh, collective, uh, in the same team overall and in the same team individually. So, of course, this is a very much uh, something that we'll watch with interest throughout this entire race weekend and the final race weekend in Thruxton. Because, remember, these guys are bidding for their first ever TPS Championship, of course. This is only, uh, their, I believe, their first ever full season in Touring Pro Series, of course, in the minis. Of course, they, they, they joined halfway through the previous championship and made an, an immediate impact. Um, uh, taking a couple of race victories and some podiums, but a bit of a, st a couple of steady races at times, but uh, weren't ex somewhere they weren't exactly up near the front. But they've taken to this championship incredibly well, of course, on the brand new platform of Game Stock Car 2013. Much improved and updated from the 2012 version, and they certainly have taken to it, to taken a shine to it incredibly fast, and they've shown their pace uh, quite rapidly as you watch the times come in for practice and. Yes, but Tolborg has found some, at least, race pace, it seems, of course, because a lot of drivers do treat the warm-up session as a way to kind of just dial their cars in for the race. It's exactly how it will perform with race fuel, with a race setup, and, of course, with the tyres at the tyre compound they're going to elect to start with. So, this should be a pretty intriguing race to see exactly how this all plays out. And, of course, we'll have to wait and see what drivers such as Yes, but Tolborg and, of course, Chris Butcher have. And there's always a chance, Rob, that uh, Chris is certainly... We talked about it quite a lot already, but Chris is certainly going to be a catalyst uh, in this championship fight between his teammate and of course as we said playing a very much a supporting role but um, it's one that unfortunately he's had to play a couple of times already uh, I think even once to yourself in fact Rob obviously when you were bidding for the championship but I mean ha is, is that difficult for a driver to do that when obviously they've been so close to the championship several times granted the fact that he hasn't been here most of the season but is that difficult for a driver to know that you have got the pace to challenge for the championship, but you just have to sit back and play second fiddle, um, whilst you know, in order to help your teammate who's in a much better position to get the championship? Well, first of all, when we battled for the championship back in season two, um, he didn't help me. You know, he was my rival, so um, he was not really in a supporting role. Actually, I'm not really sure how often Chris has been in a real supporting role in these championships. But um, last season, I was in the supporting role for Chris and. 
So I can certainly imagine how it feels. And it's not very nice when you know that you can actually do a little bit better, maybe challenge for the title. And you know, Butcher outqualified Torborg by by far in this event, right? So um, I'm pretty sure Butcher, he would rather fight for the championship himself, but he only got himself to blame that he missed the races. So um, I think now he will try to make the best out of it. And Chris is a driver who can just, who, who can win races. He's very good at this. You know, he can battle through the field, he doesn't cause many incidents or so, he can just take the positions aggressively but fairly. And yeah, he's not he's got nothing to lose. While Patrick and Camfield they're both fighting for the um for the championship title, so um I'm pretty sure he could win the race here. Well, we'll have to see exactly how that dynamic plays out as the cars now make their way onto their formation lap and we're gonna take you through the grid as they run for this uh, first race in the penultimate round here at Cascavel. And as you would expect, it is walk racing on the front row. And it's Paul Patrick who gets pole position from teammate Adrian Campfield. Chris Butcher, who returns, makes an immediate impact to qualify in third position. Uh, Ryan Walker looks like oh, he'll be no. starting from the pit lane. So this is disaster before the race has even started. For the 95 Optimus Sim Racing driver, the Scotsman Ryan Walker will not be starting from row two. And that is a real shame. Possibly some technical problems or just late coming to the grid. But you have to start and wait for everyone else to make their way through. So that means now that Klaus Nearing will start in 5th position with Peter Hennenberg who have a clear run from the inside of the grid on row 3. Then Diogo Silva will start 7th alongside Ryan Callum and uh, with J J Jonathan Osseklint in ninth, and Jesper Tolborg rounding out the top 10 as I'll let Rob continue down from 11th onwards. Yeah, in 11th position is Gus Verva who qualified a bit further down than usual. Um, alongside him, Luis Fernandez, the second uh, GT Competizione car. Then in 13th place, Matteo Oban, who's been one of the stars um, of the last races, both in Binis and the Cleos. Uh, alongside him, Tomasz Matoszewski for THR, who's also back in the championship. 15th, Andy van der Felder, and alongside him, Arichok Rasman for walk racing. Then we've got in 17th position, John Monroe for THR, who's been struggling a lot throughout the season, so uh, it's been tough for him. Ben Hexen for Optimum Sim Racing, and then Xavier de Cavallo rounding out the grid in the only Madcap car in this round. So, as the two walk racing cars pull into position, you'll see them on the left. That's Paul Sitter, Paul Patrick, car 71. And on the right, car 50. They're going to start on a crest, which means that the the cars near the top are going to be starting uphill, mainly downwards. They're going to have to find it pretty tricky to get themselves off the line for that all-important start. And we're going to wait for the lights here for the first of two 20-lap races here. And this could be a possible turning point in the championship. Here come the lights then, ready for the start for the first race at Cascavel. It's Patrick and Campford on the front row waiting for these lights to go out. They have done. And Patrick grabs the gear. Good start from him. And immediately, you see Campford having to go defensive to hold off from Butcher, who's already trying to get up the inside. Swarming all over the back of Campford down towards turn one. And Nearing has already got a great start up to fourth position with Hennenberg in fifth. And Butcher still will not give up second place. He is trying to hold around the outside. He's a brave man to do it on the first lap. But Campfield shuts the door and immediately gets himself into second position to hotel position. Butcher once again moving around to distract him as they head through this very fast sweep of turns two and three and under breaks once again. Campfield closes up once more. But what a start from these guys already, Robin. Uh, they're almost going two or three wide in the midfield as one of the THR Orange cars, I think that must have been John Monroe, getting in amongst it as they head towards the halfway through the first lap. Patrick leads it, but Campfield's already coming under pressure. Very aggressive defending from Campfield. Um, I'm not sure if that was really necessary to to pull over that much when Chris was uh, was going alongside, but yeah, he's uh, he's kept second position, so everything worked for him. Torwak up to eighth, so he already gained a bit on the st uh, at the start. I think everyone's still going though, so clean start in general. That is a relief. Thankfully, we have kept all 19 cars so far on the racetrack. So, as they head back onto the pit straight to end lap one, what a fantastic camera shot that is going through. Static one going through the final corner, and it is already Patrick and Campford running away with it so far. Butcher has dropped off quite dramatically now, is coming under the pressure from both Klaus Nearing and Peter Hennenberg into turn one. The 88 machine of Nearing trying to look to a wider outside line is already, I think. Look at look at how much pressure Campford's applying. The gloves are off with these two. They're not racing to try for the team, they're going to race for each other. And Walk Racing certainly will know that. And they'll say, look, you can race each other, but do not take yourselves off because that is the cardinal sin in both real and sim racing. Do not take your teammates out because that will have disastrous consequences. So Patrick and Campford once again almost conjoined at the hip like Siamese twins with Butcher now in third place in a bit of no man's land as he's now got the walk racing cars almost running in pairs now. As again Campford looking up the inside, there he goes up through into, set, into the lead. 
Now Patrick will look for the switch back on, on the exit of the corner for the next left-hander. Patrick Campbell has done enough and he retains the position and he will hold on to a lead. So a crucial move for, for Campbell to get into the lead, Rob, because of course he needs that as many points as he can to get himself ahead in the championship and ahead of Tolborg whilst he's back in the pack in eighth. Yeah, I'm surprised he did that so quickly. But now he's in a great position, of course. Um, it would be interesting to see if Butcher can keep up. And here's Henneberg going on the inside of Klaus Nering, of his teammate. Oh, still alongside. Nering now on the inside. A bit of contact on the straight. Nering's ahead. Just slots back ahead of him. And now Silva is attacking as well into the first corner now. Silva looks on the inside, but he can't make it stick. Henneberg's car looks pretty unsettled through that corner. But he, uh, he gets a nice line out of it. Very close. Very close indeed. It's this sweep back down through this very fast left hander. Again, Hennenberg's car does not look, as you said, uh, all that stable through that left hander as they head back and towards the, mid the middle part of lap number three. And what's intriguing is that Butcher's managed to find his feet after that very, rather shaky start. And he has now caught up to the back of uh, Patrick and Campfield. And what is also intriguing is that Campbell is not being allowed to get away here because Patrick is certainly keeping pace at the moment and he's bringing Chris Butcher into, this, into what is now a three-way fight for the lead whilst best of the rest is still being held by Nearing. They head through. Uh, Cal is now still seventh but he's now got Tolmore for company with jo jo Jonathan Osclint and Luis Fernandez rounding out this top ten. Then Gus Verbert, Matty Orban, Archuk Razvan, Dick Ovalio, Haxon, Van der Velde, Malazewski, Monroe, and Walker, who started from the pit lane, is quite a way back, but he starts trying to charge his way back through to gain some kind of result from this race after missing out. Down the pit straight, Campbell set to fast lap of the race, immediately duped by Butcher, won 14.5, as oh. here comes Hennenberg down towards the first corner. He will get his nose in front. Nearing's going to try again, stick it around the outside. How much confidence has Nearing got in that mini? He's, he might even leave the door open for Silver. He almost drifts too wide, and he tries to come back across. There is almost contact between the pair of them, and Silver takes maximum advantage. He's up to fifth position as oh, in the back one, Oscar goes off. very wide. Oscar gets shoved out very wide indeed, and he loses out to, to uh, Luis Fernandez. Now, I wonder if we can get a very quick replay of that. And all you see there, that was uh, well, how do you call it, Rob? It looks as though that uh, Oscar. Clint, well, uh, it was hard to see the beginning of the move. On, uh, it looked like Oscar Clint makes go. a mistake, and Fernandez thinks he can go on the inside. There you go, Oscar Clint just. Has no contact here, Ockerklin just breaks a little bit too late, car gets unstable, now Fernandez wants to go through. Oh, and they make contact. I think Fernandez just underestimated that Ockerklin was already alongside him again and pushed him a bit wide. I'm, I think Fernandez should maybe get, give the position back to Ockerklin after that. Got a great scrap going on here. Andy van der Velde is now coming under massive pressure from, looks like, Ben Haxen and the THR Orange duo as they're almost going to go three wide into the final corner. It looks like Haxon will keep the line as Campbell again sets the fastest lap of the race, 114.503. As again, this battle rages on. Van der Velde there in the blue machine, car 78, ahead of car number two. That's Ben Haxon. And then John Monroe and Thomas Banaszewski getting into another inter team battle. As Banaszewski will look to the inside to try and get himself past his young Scottish teammate. And he just cannot seem to get it done this point. As Banaszewski still trying to give his uh, teammate headaches as he puts him a little bit wide and forces him to the outside of the corner. And Monroe has to give his teammate trap position. And he will have to sit back, and he's now going to be back in 18th spot. So, Monroe not exactly running at the same electric pace as Ryan Walker does his best to try and close in. We head back towards the front, and again, these top three have pulled away slightly. Or, or, I say slightly, they've pulled the gap out to uh, about uh, two, about almost two seconds. Hedenberg, who himself is trying to gap the cars behind him. Silver now up to fifth. Uh, now, hold a second. What's happened to Klaus Nearing? That's Klaus Nearing. He's down to ninth position now. What's happened to Klaus here? Must have happened a while ago. Oh, he runs wide. Completely wide. on All his own. What is he doing? Look at this. So the replay, we look at it here, Rob, and just understeers wide. Has to break to, to try and stop himself getting offline, but it's too late. And taking full advantage are Silva and Callan and Talborg. So, yeah, not all exactly all that could be. He's, he's going to fight back down towards turn one. As he makes the move on Luis Fernandez, is he going to be able to keep enough stability in that number 88 machine? He can. And uh, looks at like Fernandez already, already thinking about the switchback, and he might just get it as he comes off the exit of turn number one. He has got enough to uh, get up and go off the corner, but Klaus Nearing proves that he's stronger and he keeps himself in front. And look at the amount of dust being formed as Fernandez thinking he's going to try and close up a little bit more under brakes. Also, Clint is recovering from his earlier incident with Fernandez, and Gustav Verva now running in 11th spot. So those guys. On a tightly packed uh, scrap 
for what is now going to become 8th position. Borwick's gone past Silva. Actually, Cullen is also past Silva, so something must have happened there as well. Oh, you are incredibly, you're indeed right. So Talborg has taken two places. He is now around Silva and also Callan. So Talborg making his charge back up towards the front. Next target is going to be Peter Hennenberg in the number 35 machine. Walk racing, so walk racing. But as it currently stands, Cap was there. I think was that Talborg anyway. Talborg oh. was wide. He wants to miss the final call. Oh. Contact with Diego and Silva. Silva sideways puts his foot down. As you do in front, we'll drive cars. Incredible save from the Can we get a driver. replay of this? Absolutely, we can get a replay. Oh, is Callan oh, pushing him off? Callan it's Ryan Callan pushing him off. Look at that. So I mean, oh, this, is that a, this is a terrible re entry from, from Jesper Torog, but if you're. If this is the guy who's fighting for the championship, and just Callan just blatantly runs into the back of him here in this corner. This is just really bad. Yeah. It's just a really, really low move, oh. and he's not even attempting to give the position back. That's just, that's just bad. And Torx championship is over now, because he will get a penalty for the rejoin with Silver. You know, how should he recover that? There will certainly be a penalty. I mean, you have to blame Torx for that. It's not Ryan's fault, that, but that's an awful rejoin from Jesper Torx. You know, I'm not trying to... to protect Jesper here or anything, but this was really, really bad. Can't just... Oh, Ryan, Ryan actually has given the position back. But, you know, it cost, cost Jesper a lot of momentum and just put him in a bad position. I don't think that was so... I don't think that was so clever. Well, it's, it's not exactly the Jesper Tolborg that we're used to seeing. It was a rather careless rejoin, I do have to admit. Yoga Silva, the innocent party, because you saw from the replay, he was sat back, not exactly uh, massively in the fight between 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 Cal and Tolborg. And uh, thanks to the bit of contact, which I'm sure <laughs> Ryan will explain away, uh, later on in the driver interviews as to what exactly happened but um, obviously as a result of that Tarborg not exact, not really looking in his mirrors all that much and then didn't realise Diogo Silva was coming up hot on his, hot on his outside and then just gives him an incredibly large clout in the side which almost set Diogo Silva loose but the trick with these cars of course is that you have to floor the throttle in the front wheel drive car to bring the front around of course because it's not like a real wheel drive car we have to balance the throttle it's in exactly the other way around counter steer uh, foot foot flats the floor and accelerator and, the, and around the thing comes as <laughs> Chris Butcher drops a wheel onto the uh, outside grass at the penultimate turn as they come onto the long back straight and it's uh, pretty incredible that these cars can hold some incredible angles but somehow gather it all back up again well the thing with uh, Torwok was I mean in fairness to Ryan Ryan went into the back of him but Ryan didn't put Torwok's car into a position where he was sliding or so Torwok was actually pretty much in control um, once he was off the track there and then Torvok, I don't know if he got distracted by the by the fact that he got hit by by Cullen before, but he was just wasn't looking at all that Silver was there and just completely went into Silver's car. Silver will have a lot of damage, and of course for for Jesper that's bad in in two ways. The first thing is, oh, there you see, he runs wide again. First thing is he has damage. Second thing is he will get a penalty. So, yeah, certainly <laughs> it's a big blow to Torvok's championship chances. And I'm they, sure Ryan didn't do it on purpose, you know. I'm sure Ryan just outbraked himself there a little bit, but it doesn't look really doesn't really look good if a walk racing car runs into the back of the uh, of the THR Championship contender, does it? Certainly doesn't. Doesn't paint a pretty picture, that's for sure. You can see the small dent on the inside of uh, Tarbo's car as he's now kind of getting stuff fighting away back on the end of uh, the rear end of Callan. That'll be revenge on the cards for a number 17 machine. Is it just behind? There's a huge scrap going on. I think, I think possibly Fernandez is tag nearing. He gets to get into the side of Silva. He's involved in his second act as many, as, in as many laps. As now look at this also. Oscar swarming around. It's almost a 4 5 wide. Look at this pack Storm, storming down towards the final corner. As uh, almost uh, Gus Verbert almost gets put out onto the grass. They're going to hit the brakes. And nearing comes out on top. Or has he? Because Fernandez pushes him wide across the Astro Cuts. He has to get it. Oh, oh he loses it. Of, and how on earth? Oh, oh Fernandez is off. Alfred Silva spinning on the pit straight. That's Luis end Fernandez. Of, end around there. And that is an end of Silva's race, unfortunately. It's Luis Fernandez who, who went to the barrier here. It's Fernandez, my apologies. Here. It is Luis Fernandez. Let's look again. And it's exactly the same situation as we have with Talborg and Silva. So Luis Fernandez just nails the pit wall. And unfortunately, I have a feeling that that car is going nowhere. In fact, if I quick look back, yes, he has retired. So, sadly, Luis Fernandez is out of this race. And oh, we have to admit, Rob, through no fault of his own, because he was minding his own oh, business. And I think I think this was his fault. He went into the corner. He pushed Nearing off. Yeah, and Nearing was actually point, sideways. Yeah. 
And it's almost not like Torvok, that Torvok could catch the car immediately and he wasn't going sideways. But Nuring was pushed into a slide and just couldn't do anything, just uh, slid back on the, onto the track and just collected Fernandez slightly. So, I mean, that's, uh, you could call it karma, I mean, <laughs> it's not what you, what you really wish for Fernandez. I mean, you know, this could have all gone, gone right and he would have just given the position back, everything's fine. But I mean, there's always a risk when you attack in, into a fourth gear high speed corner with anti cuts on the outside, and this time it certainly didn't pay off. Poor Luis Fernandez, as uh, as you stated, Rob, kind of like a maker of his own fate, because unfortunately the small contact he made did unfortunately spell the end of his first race, and he'll be back to try and fight another day in race two. Meanwhile, Patrick was uh, getting a little bit sideways through turn one, but he is keeping pace with Campfield. As again, look at how much he's drifting that thing through there. When he starts on pole, chasing the man who is ahead of him in the championship. But Butcher doing his best to try and keep these two honest at the front. He knows that if anything happens between them, he can take full advantage. Hellenberg has dropped back, but he's still keeping consistent in fourth. Callan has managed to retain his advantage in front of Tolborg in sixth position. And Silver, through all the troubles, is up to seventh. And this uh, Motley crew is still battling away for eighth place. And it's incredible how the battle has now become Optum Sim Racing versus walk racing as it's now coming through you're also leading it in the pack in eighth with nearing verva and matty orban who started outside the top 10 currently running 11th and uh, certainly trying to find some pace as he as we just gone past the second half of the race also just behind i've spotted the two thr orange cars are still dueling away as madazeski has trapped position and the advantage of a teammate munro who is giving a bit of nascar style tandem drafting down the back straight towards the final corner let's be careful oh, oh, the Vandenberg misses his breaking point, clips the back of Munro, and somehow they all gathered it up. Matuszewski has runs over the, the anti-cuts, but my goodness, Rob, if you did get a look at a replay of that one, that could have so easily ended in disaster. Uh, first of all, I think John's bump drafting here, yeah, that's not allowed. <laughs> but probably the bump drafting saved him, because that way he was uh, a little bit further ahead of Vandenberg, who just, uh, you know, just braked on the grass. Oh, oh near, that? uh, that's uh, Verva, Verva's, Verva's off. The no, Verva's off, and let's see what happens. Now, is this again his own doing? Because he hits yeah. the brakes just behind Klaus Nearing, and he just understeers. He has to brake to avoid getting to the back of his teammate. Ooh. He just drops a wheel. And that was uh, kept as well to keep it <laughs> off the barriers. And the tarmac certainly doing its job of keeping the car in one piece and uh, gripping when it needs to. And rejoins, and he will come back on in 16th place. He's now behind Van der Velde, and also Carvalho and Haxer, so we allowed them through. So, pretty tricky stuff from this lot, and uh, they're all going off everywhere. So, as we said, Rob, of course, even though you've won here, you'll know that Cascavel is rather short circuit, but do not take any liberties with it because it will bite back and bite hard. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure what everyone's doing here today. <laughs> but <laughs> it's certainly possible not to crash on this track. And uh, especially, you know, I can understand it when you're battling with someone, you can easily make a mistake. But that was, you know, what the Verver just did, that was completely a fault of his, of his own doing. You know, there was no one else involved. It just tried a bit too hard to go too fast to the corner and he was in a really nice position in the top 10 so now he probably has no chance to get there anymore. Now this situation up at the front here between Campbell and Patrick, I mean how do you read this Rob because is this a case of Patrick saying well let's just sit back here, let's run in formation and then wait for the final couple of laps and then go hell for leather or is this genuinely Patrick having to run as hard as he can to keep up with Campfield because of the pace that he's setting because Patrick's getting close, but he's not getting enough opportunities uh, to, to, to present it presented to himself to really capitalise on, on any pace that he has an advantage over on Campfield if he's able to get through. And so far, it hasn't come to fruition, but he's doing the best he can to try and get through because he knows he has to to retain his points advantage. Points advantage. Well, you could see it there, um, and he's definitely not trying to attack. He lifted off on the straight. Um, at, at this point, the situation is fine for him. I'm not sure how it is fine for him, maybe Kempfield can, can pull a gap on Butcher and that's good for him. But uh, Patrick's actually behind Kempfield in the points, Patrick is in third position. Oh, okay. Patrick? Where's he gone? Oh, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that looked a bit strange. Just know I switched the camera, so it's right. They didn't disappear, <laughs> there was no lag spike, it was my fault. Carry on. Um, well, Patrick, if he wants to win the championship, he has to beat Kempfield in this race. And maybe he can wait and try to make a move um, towards the end of the race. Maybe he doesn't want to attack Camfield. Maybe they're still working together and just try to get Camfield to the championship title. I'm not entirely sure yet. 
but uh, he's certainly not been attacking in the last few laps. Seems to be a kind of different mindset because everyone watching here wants them to go ahead and, and scrap away for the lead in the course of potentially a championship place because they know they have a, a position and points advantage over Talborg and they will overtake him in the standings regardless of where these two, which way these two, end, which way these two end up on the podium. But everyone at home is at home watching is sitting thinking, well, come on guys, get on with it, let's see some racing. But I'm sure on the other end, walk racing, we're thinking, let's just bring these cars home and secure a championship, and then you guys can go for it for the drivers' championship. I know there's one guy who's watching who's hoping, okay, don't do anything, just stay like this. And that's the team boss of Walk Racing. <laughs> Meanwhile, Silva has passed Torvok. Oh, Patrick sideways! Not the first time he's done that. Torvok's back past Silva. So they are certainly battling hard. Yep. Cut back Silver. to Silva, that should work actually. Ooh! <laughs> there's no love lost between <laughs> those two, is there? Because they've done that once before. Yeah, I think this one was okay though. That was not really unfair from anyone. Oh, Torx, Fesso, hang on around the outside. Oh, this should work, yeah. Oh, that's that's incredible. That was brave stuff from Jesper Tolborg. He's got the inside run. If you can get the better traction. And Diogo Silva will still won't let it go. They've been side by side for almost an entire lap so far. I don't want to jinx it, but they are still going toe to toe with it. Silva will have the inside run now. Former left hander at the top of the hill. And can he get it in front? Tolborg is still staying around the outside. Oh, this is a fantastic sequence of corners between the pair of them. And Silver finally gets the place done. Now, what's Talbot going to have in terms of a run? A little bit loose for Silver, which means that Talbot will have the better, better run he needs. He'll be into the draft sooner. And I wonder if he'll be able to challenge down into the final corner as we go ahead to start lap number 15 of 20. He won't get it done this time as they get just behind. That's nearing on the under uh, on the attack against Osseklint in front of him in 8th position. And back down the pit straight. Palborg knows that and the longer he spends behind Silver, the more he points he's losing out on. So the car's in front as Talborg again dives to the inside. Silver thinks, uh-uh, ain't going to happen and goes back around the outside. Oscar just behind gets a little bit sideways in the battle for eighth. And Nearing has to hold on and try and fight. But what's intriguing also is that these two battles are just starting to gravitate towards each other. And Oscar is now starting to reel in these two as they fight. So as I've said before, the harder they fight each other, the easier it's going to be for the cars around to take advantage, for the cars in front to pull away, and for the cars behind to catch up and create an even bigger pack fighting for position. Yeah, and Torvok won't like that at all. You know, it's only in seventh place now. We can truly assume we will get a four point penalty for at, at least a four point penalty for hitting uh, Silver. So uh, he's just losing ground, a lot of ground, and now maybe uh, who's that behind him? Ocke, Clint, Nuring. Maybe they can pass him as well because uh, Torvok's car has damage and Silver's car also has damage from the contact that these two made. And um, I think Ocke, Clint's car has a little dent at the front, but it looks more or less fine. And Nuring has only been off once but didn't hit anything. So they maybe have a faster car at this stage. These two, of course, know each other well. Silver running a little bit wide, as is Oscar and Nearing. Tolbog with the tire to run, and that's exactly what he can do now. He'll go to the outside again, as Silver did a lap ago. I wonder now if Tolbog will this time try to sweep around the outside, and again, Silver's got the advantage of his nose in front. And look at how Oscar closes up under braking because Tolbog is being held up, and he really is being held up because look at how much Oscar has closed in. And Tolbog was practically pushing the Portuguese driver. He's looking this way and that, but desperately seeking a way through. He cannot seem to get it done this point. Silver is making that duty competition. He oh, Oscar Clint. Oscar diving up the inside. There's a bit of contact, bit of a hip and shoulder from Oscar and, and the <laughs> swing is through. And Tolbog will not like that one bit. Yeah, but this was this was really, really aggressive, but I think this was a great move. I was kind of on the edge, so there was a little bit of contact, but he saw the gap there and just went for it. Kept the contact to a minimum. Torvik didn't, you know, it didn't lose anything from it. Just the position. I think it was a great opportunistic move from Walker Clint. Certainly was. There was a bit of hip, there was a tiny bit of ball rubbing, but effectively there wasn't anything major contact. And as you said, Torvik left the door open, and it was simply a case of thank you very much, Jesper. You can leave that open. I'll take that every single day from you. Don't think so, Torvik expected that. <laughs> I think he was more focused on Silver in front to try and get the pass done, and didn't really realise there was a flying Swede up his inside. But. Um, there we go. That's racing, of course. You take your chances. There's the Are they answer. catching up to Callum? I think they, it looks like it. Well, What's Callum, going on there? Well, Callum has a 1.6 second advantage over Silver going into the 18th lap out of 20. There was, uh, I think, and these four are scrapping amongst each other enough anyway to hold each other up. So Callum really should be taking advantage of this. If he's not, and he's actually dropping back, then either there is something wrong with Callum's car, which if there is, we haven't really seen or heard about. Or he just simply has lost pace down to the end, near, near the end of this race and the end of the stint. So, it'll be quite intriguing. But that said, Diogo Silva's leading the pace. Oscar is looking pretty racy behind. 
Powerpoke doesn't seem to have enough left in the tank to try and make a really serious challenge, and, and Nero just seems to be sat back thinking, well, I'm content with ninth place, I don't really see a chance to really, really challenge unless something comes up, but although as I say that, Nearing has a small look up the inside into the left-hander. Also, okay. I'm, I'm just looking through the, through the field, did we lose someone, because Matuszewski is now in 10th place, and I know he was outside the top 10 before, I'm not quite sure what happened there. Oh, Matej Orban, he's out. Yeah, we lost Matej Orban. So that's unfortunate for the Optum Sim Racing team. Look, they're on that. They're, they're now a car down. Here comes Osaglint again. Ever ambitious this week. He really has improved, improved as a driver in this championship. Ooh, look at that. Shaky Silver Cars line aggressively now talks back to And look through. at Talbo. Talbo with a great opportunity. Maybe he's going to go to the outside of Osaglint. And he's also going to try and get past Silver around the outside. He's going to be later under brakes. No, Silver's much better. Nearing now looking for an outside oh, pass. Oh, contact. Ockerklin. Ockerklin. Osaglint. Oh, my <laughs> Silver, they touch. Tarbog gets a little bit sideways, Osgood coming back across from Nearing as they're not careful, they're going to come to blows. Tarbog is back on the outside, kicking up some dust, we can't see it just yet. And Oscar keeps those in front, and Nearing's now going to get in front, and Tarbog can shuffle back to ninth. Incredible, he goes from sixth to ninth in the space of a few corners. Incredible stuff in the midfield. That was some really, really tough defending from Diogo Silva there. He was just moving to the inside immediately as he saw that someone might get an overlap. And I think that slowed, uh, first it slowed Ockerklin down. And Torwok seemed to have a run, but then when Torwok tried to do the cutback, Silver moved to the inside and Torwok got slowed down. So, uh, yeah, Ockerklin actually gained the position and uh, Nuring did everything right, he just waited there. And then we see it again, Silver just defending very, very aggressively. Of course, we're very close to the end of the race, so he doesn't want to, doesn't want to lose anything. We were at the front of the field, um, 0 0.5 seconds, Campfield's lead now. It looks pretty safe. The gap has I think safe, yeah. Bit. Ockerklin, now, now he should have the overlap. What's Silver doing? Why is he giving him so little room? Well, yes, we have to, he's trying to defend his position as best he can. He now moves back up to the outside because he really just has to get the racing line. Sweeps Ooh. across. That was... Brave stuff. Oh, that, was, that was brave and I think a little bit kind of risky there from Silver. Yeah. Wasn't going to work nearing, forcing his way up the inside. He's on uh, Oscar's back back wheel and just cuts him off there. Oh, Silver made a mistake. Silver this. made a mistake. Ockerklin has up. a chance now. Opens up the door and Neary's going to follow him through. They always touch him. <laughs> They're going to be side by side again. This is fantastic race in the midfield. And Oscar almost slides Look away. Look at Neary's, Neary's, open, Neary's taking advantage of the open door. Here he comes. They are literally three wide on the exit. And Tarbo getting the toe from Osaclin. Tarbo gets the inside to, now for the next one. We're going to have to cut away in a second. I, I, I'm ashamed that we have to because we're going to have to see Catwood and Patrick. We're going to have to come across the line in a moment. We, we will rejoin it as soon as we can. Watching these two down the back straight for the final time. Cut away to it very quick to see what's going on between these four. They're still going at it. Oh, the Silver lost out. Silver, Silver lost out. shuffled back. He's off on the grass. We have to cut away because the leader's now coming back down towards the pit straight. And even though Patrick closes, Campbell will take the race victory in race one at Cascavel. Second to Patrick and third for Chris Butcher. But back to that battle. What's going on between these guys? They've, they've dropped back into two separate packs. Osaka will be the winner out of this one. As Silver is probably going to hold on for seventh place. Tobol's going to close. But Osaka in the great so driving, he gets fifth. From no, Tarbog in sixth position. Sixth That's position, sorry. Callan in between. Yeah, Callan fifth, so my apologies. Oscar will get sixth from Talborg, and Diogo Silva will hold on to eighth. With Torres Manizewski rounding out the top ten. Vanderbilt gets eleventh for Rockat. Then uh, it's Monroe in twelfth position. Carvalho in thirteenth with Gus Verba fourteenth. And Arachuk Razvan in fifteenth. Walker, starting from the back of the back of the field in the pit lane, will start sixteenth after he qualified fourth originally. And Ben Haxon in seventeenth place. We had a couple of retirements. We had Matteo Orban and Luis Fernandez after his antics. But whew, what a what a race for race, especially in the midfield. The front runners did provide, provide a, a little bit of action early on, but all the battles were up in the midfield. And we were treated to some great battles all down the field, especially with that four-way scrap at the end. Yeah, that was a crazy scrap there. And uh, I'm amazed that everyone kept it on, on the track. You know, there was a bit of contact here and there, but in general, just great to watch. And um, Ockerklin actually came out on top, so good race once again from Jonathan. He certainly has improved a lot this season. He's not one of the top drivers of the league, you know, you have to say it. He certainly is. He's, he's good at battling, he's fast. I'm, I'm really impressed by him. One has to wonder how long is it before he takes another championship charge. Whether or not he's got that in him, I'm sure that with the rate of improvement, he will certainly be up there in contention. I mean, actually, what do you think, Rob? Of course, he's now, of course, sixth position. He really has got some great, shown some great racecraft today with some late breaking moves and some great defensive work. So, do you think it's it's not long before Arthur Clint, if he keeps on developing at this rate, that he could possibly be challenging for race victories and then later on be a championship contender? Do you think that's too soon to say something like that? 
I think that's too soon to say because the problem is that Camfield and Patrick, and in this <laughs> race also Butcher, they're just you know from the pace, they're just still a little bit in the in a different league to everyone. And Nockerklin certainly seems to be um, you know that he can take on everyone else from his pace. It's no problem. He can, he can battle hard as well, and he's showing that he can battle hard and clean. But I think for a victory, he either needs to step up his pace a little bit more, or he needs to just find the right, the right time and place, you know, a track where everything works, and then there's maybe a little bit of contact ahead, and he can maybe sneak through, and then certainly he can win the race. But now he's he's getting into a position where you know where you can think about it. Well, Oscar did say before the race to myself that the racing is usually for viewers awesome. I get this word because we were treated to some first class battling up and down the field. Of course, it is Adrian Catford who takes his fourth race victory of the season, and that will certainly put him in good stead, along with Paul Patrick, in moving up ahead of Jesper Tolbock in the standings. We're going to step aside for just a couple of moments to allow you guys to say to uh, give thanks to our, our good friends at Inside Sim Racing, and we'll be back with all of the rest of the fallout from race one, and looking ahead to race two here at Castlegville. But Catford wins from Patrick second, Butcher third, back in a few moments. InsideSimRacing.tv, the fastest show on the internet. Sim racing news and reviews since 2007, with new shows every week. Welcome back to live coverage of this, the fifth and penultimate round of the to touringproseries.com 2014 virtual mini challenge here at Cascavel. And for those of you who uh, were watching race one, you were treated to some fantastic uh, um, racing and a great spectacle, which saw Adrian Kemp would eventually come out on top after starting on the front row, beating his teammate Paul Patrick uh, with, with Chris Butcher on his first race back in the series for a, a little while, managing a third place victory and a po third place position and a podium, whilst just behind Jesper Tobol could only settle for eighth position as uh, he had to fight hard with the likes of Diogo Silva, uh, Klaus Neering and uh, John Jonathan Osterklint who just held out. I think that actually you know, Tobol was seventh, my apologies, Tobol was seventh um, as they battled along a way with each other. So for those who want to keep up to date with everything that's going on at touringproseries.com, it's uh, Touring Pro Series, that is touringproseries.com is the website. For all the information you have got of course our Hall of Fame and our uh, all-time uh, leaderboard standings as well for who is the be best driver in terms of race victories, championships, points, podiums, and the lot. Uh, also, we have, that's the TPS rankings, I should say. Also, facebook.com forward slash Touring Pro Series to give us a like and we'll see, you'll see some great photos from Jesper Tolborg and his Photoborg uh, rendering company. Also, we have twitter.com forward slash Touring underscore Pro to keep up to date with everything that's going on. And also, if you want to catch any of this and any race broadcast back live, uh, or back in at any point, should you wish to, then there is youtube.com forward slash touring pro series, where you will find uh, every single race broadcast that we do uploaded back in full for you to watch at your leisure. And uh, so if you miss any key moments, then don't worry, head on to the YouTube page, give it a subscribe and you'll never miss out on any races. Again, yeah, one championship you don't want to miss out on, of course, is going to be starting in a couple of weeks' time. It is the Virtual Touring Masters Classic, and it is a championship that takes the same structure as it was this season back in Race 2, back on our Factor 1, uh, with the Touring Car Engines mod and visiting some classic circuits, including Spa-Francorchamps, Suzuka, Laguna Seca, Pukekohe, Salzburg Ring, uh, as well as Brands Hatch, and, of course, the season finale, which is at the mighty Mount Panorama, as you can see. It's a circuit that doesn't hold memory too, memories too well for a certain Toby Davis, because on three separate occasions that he's raced there in TPS, he's been claimed by the same corner. And so to mark the occasion, to mark this uh, unfortunate st statistic, the, the S's at Bathurst for this championship has been renamed the Davis S's. I wonder possibly if having his own name on them is either uh, tempting fate or it'll be a blessing in disguise. And whether or not Davis will relish that, and eventually break the curse of Mount Panorama and take his first victory there. Because it is going to be a championship, Rob, that, of course, I'm sure you're looking to take part in as well. Of course, you've been pretty mighty at the will of a historic touring car in these championships. And you have to admit, obviously, I'm not sure how many times you've raced in this series, but the 
These Group A Touring cars really come from a golden era of tin top racing. They really do epitomise what it was like back in the 80s. And these things are just absolutely fantastic to drive and an awesome spectacle to watch in whatever series, both real or sim racing. Yeah, and this grid looks so strong. I mean, the sign-up's already open, so you can already see a couple of drivers who have signed up. And their car choices, and you'll see Toby Davis and Chris Butcher in the Ford Sierra. That mighty powerful car that's actually pretty good all around, but it's just eating the tires a lot. Then Rasmus Salo, the quick finish driver, he's in the Holden, so he would be very good at the fast tracks. Eric Twight, of course, in the Rover. He's probably one of the championship favorites this time out, because the Rover is really, really fast. And Twight seems to be the best one in the car as well. Then we've got Adrian Holm, John Monroe, and uh, Ross McGregor, for example, in the Nissan Skyline. Jonas Rivio, who was really strong in the V8, and then Alfa Romeo. So lots of top drivers out there. Um, and certainly some, some names that we haven't heard so far, they will be challenging at the front as well. It just seems to be, you know, this seems to be a really, really great lead. And if you guys do want to keep, how do have our Act 1, you like the sound of the Touring Car Legends, and you fancy going these, these machines, go up against some of the best drivers that TPS has to offer. And head over to the forums, which are headed, hosted by ins, our good friends at InsideSimRacing.tv. Head over to the Touring Pro Series section and get yourself signed up over there. Now, when it comes, of course, to uh, sign-ups, they finish on the 19th of this month. So you have until next Thursday to get your name down. And already the grid is pretty strong, as Rob said. We have over 40 entries already, and I'm sure that number is going to grow going forwards into next week before Thursday. Of course, the first race will take place on June the 25th. Be next Wednesday, if I'm correct. Yes, next Wednesday at uh, Spa Frankenstein. I'm pretty sure on the old nice 88 layout. So do not miss that. If you want to see some old school touring car racing, but, and if you and you enjoy it with the RMs, head over there, or head over to us on our broadcast page, touringproseries.com forward slash broadcast for all the action, and you'll be able to catch some fantastic historic touring cars, just like it used to be back at TPS in the old days. So back out on track, then we've got the cars already out there for qualifying with seven minutes left in the session. Really a bit of a scrap going on between, I think, Oscar Clint and one of the GT, GT Competizione cars. So already, Rob, we're in qualifying, and these two still resume their battles from race one. Yes, you were still the same guy that battled with Oscar Clint <laughs> in the race, and they also made a little bit of contact in the first corner. It was just like they've never stopped racing. Um, but looking at the times, Patrick and Camfield both already in the uh, 114.4s, and I think Patrick's time is faster than the best time that he set in the, um, the last qualifying session. Now you see they are drafting as well. They're not trying to waste any opportunities there. 40.3. Oh, Patrick, three. look at Patrick's time. Great time. Patrick, 14.3. They're using the advantage of a toe. Still hasn't beaten my lap record, but I think these cars got a little bit slower <laughs> for this season. <laughs> yes, for those who want a reminder of um, what Rob is talking about, of course, the lap record in these cars is actually a 1 minute 14.190 set by uh, Mr. Wiesenmuller himself. So, uh, I'm sure that he's got a, 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 wry, a wry smirk on his face by the fact that he still holds that st the statistic for the moment, at least. And the key phrase is for the moment, because Campbell and Patrick, they're pushing pretty hard. But um, what do you reckon? If you got out there, Rob, do you reckon you could give them a run for their money in qualifying? No. <laughs> I love that short one-word answer to the point. No. <laughs> that settles that, that, that question, then. But... Um, Obviously, these guys have really set on the great championship, and of course, I'm not sure how much you've driven of the of the Mini and GameStop car 2013. But it, a lot of drivers have said that, from what I believe, that this car is certainly an improvement. Of course, the improved physics engine has definitely uh, given a bit more feel uh, down to the road, which is fantastic to, to see and hear about. Uh, but of course, I'm not I'm not sure how much I said. I'm sure you've driven this car at some point. But what, in your personal personal opinion, are the, are the major differences between? This car in Game Stock Car 2013 compared to 2012. Oh, Butcher, by the way, just into second place with the point three as well. Great time from him. Bought the car. Um, it feels very similar to last season, so the difference is not that big. It, to me, it felt like it, you know, it reacts more to bumps on the track or to, to curbs. It just gets a little bit more unsettled by that. It's not really dramatic or anything. Um, the car's definitely slower from the lap times the last season so this is the only reason why I keep this lap record because these guys are really pushing hard <laughs> um, in general I mean it's still a mini you know still the same characteristics apply that this car is great and when you're when you're drafting you, you gain an advantage because you also have more grip and more speed um, it's quite understeer by default but you can do a lot with the tire pressures and I'm pretty sure a lot of these guys are running very high rear tire pressures 
especially the walk racing cars because they seem to be sliding into the corners you know which I think is caused by the higher rear tire pressures you know at THR we've also you know we always have gone a little bit different route um so uh, yeah you can you can't really change much on the setups uh, it's very limited but tire pressures is the most important factor you can also change the rear wing a bit but um very rarely you see people running with the rear wing higher than two i think last season at taruma that was the only exception where, where it really makes sense maybe on this track as well i'm not entirely sure um yeah in general the cars are great just a bit slow maybe you know maybe you're <laughs> when you're used to driving the drm cars for example or the super tech cars from last season then you know you want to go a little bit faster can't you know they just don't have so much horsepower but yeah but certainly that uh, you know provides good action in the races because everyone's so close as well I know we've mentioned also the fact that these cars have a very limited setup window and capability in terms of what you can and can't change so I mean but from your experience does that does that enhance the way these cars are perceived as a driver because effectively because everyone's having to run an incredibly level playing field in terms of the car and it and with one mixed series like this, it really is down to the driver, or does that kind of hinder you a little bit because effectively there's more that you want to do, but you know that because the setup is fairly fixed, you can't really change anything? Well, the thing is, if there, there are certain types of drivers. There are some drivers that can drive every car, and uh, they, you know, it doesn't really matter how the car feels. And then there are some cars who, who need to have their car in a very specific way. You know, they can't deal with understeer, for example. And because of the limited setup option, if you don't like the initial feeling of the minis, there isn't really much you can do. So probably you, you just won't like this car. There's nothing you can change about it. You can, you know, you can come a bit closer with the tire pressures, but it won't change the general characteristics. While in some other cars, you can really do a lot over the setup. Um, on the other hand, of course, it, it also ensures that everyone's really on uh, on, on similar material, you know, and the teams, the big teams that are working a lot on the setup, they don't really have so much of an advantage over the smaller teams. So uh, yeah, that's positive and negative points, I would say. Uh, personally, I always... And again, I'm, I'm one of the drivers, who, you know, it just actually worked with my style, I didn't really have to adapt much. But I, I know certainly that, for example, with John Monroe, he's struggling a lot just to get this, you know, just to get used to these cars, because he's used to different, uh, different driving behavior. On board with Ryan Walker, the fantastic wheel cam. Heads now through turns two and three. And currently now sat in fourth position on the grid with a minute and a half left to go in this qualifying session. Uh, Paul Patrick currently still has the fastest time, one minute 20, 40, one minute 14.321, with Chris Butcher now alongside him on the front row. So he now splits the two championship contenders in walk racing uh, up into second place. And Walker is again on the personal vessel, we'll mention it in a second. Campbell third, Walker now in fourth position. Yoga Silva's up to fifth, uh, six one thousandth of a second behind Walker's time. So incredible effort from the Scotsman to get himself up onto row two once again. Uh, fingers crossed. You have to hope that he doesn't suffer the same problems he had for race one that forced him to start from the back of the grid. Because the pace that he's showing right now, who knows exactly? We can only wonder uh, how far how far up in, in the front he would have been, possibly challenging for a top five or maybe even the podium at least if he held pace. Uh, with Chris Butcher, if it were, if it were possible, uh, Diogo Silva fifth. Then we've got another close fight between Otto Klint sixth, Tolborg seventh, and Peter Hennenberg eighth. With Gustav on a personal best in ninth, one fourteen point eight four four, and then Thomas Madzewski rounding out the top ten, one fourteen point nine one three. There's about six tenths of a second that separates the top ten. So uh, for a World Bank series, of course, Rob, it's uh, incredibly close out there. But then again, it's not, it's not surprising at the same time. It's perfect take into account that the Minis are such uh, an equal car when it comes to uh, uh, you know p providing a level playing field for all driving styles and it gives even some of the drivers who prefer real drive a chance to try and push up if they can take that if, if they can handle it um, and uh, sometimes the, tra tra the transition does go pretty smoothly yeah uh, certainly Ryan Walker is one of these guys who I mean he's done a couple of races in the Mini before but nothing serious I would say and um, yeah this season he's been he's been doing pretty well um, struggled through a few races, but at this race he is certainly on the pace. And Yogo Silva probably is another one. I've only seen him in the Porsches before, and he was right on the pace. And he's right on the pace here as well. Doesn't seem to harm him at all. Qualifying the time is now up, so people can finish the laps. Not sure if anyone can improve. Campfield is still out there, but I'm not sure if he's actually on lap. 
but well, the timer is going whether sometimes because thanks to how the sim works sometimes the timer can still go if you cross the line at zero second which means this lap might not count or they'll have to wait and see if Walker is still pushing on and if he is allowed to finish this lap he is still hard, pushing hard which suggests that he possibly will be he's only about um, just, just under two tenths per second off somebody in front's kicking up uh, quite a little bit of dust using all the track and a bit more but it looks, it looks as though the grid's possibly set. Campbell, I think, is ahead. No, he's, he's pulled into the pits as far as I can see. Apologies for that. Uh, and the grid seems to be just about decided. Oscar is up on the track in seventh, but he's not going to improve at all. So he will obviously come to the uh, end of the end of the straight and pull straight into pit lane, which indeed he does. Get anchored up. That is the session over. So Paul Patrick takes his second pole position of the weekend. Tolborg comes in behind Jonathan Oscar. Tolborg only managing eight, so these two will start on row four alongside each other. Fought so hard over sixth position, along with Diogo Silva and right and also Klaus Nearing as well. Bringing that those uh, the four protagonists in that in that fight are fifth, seventh, eighth, and tenth, so all inside of the top ten, and they're certainly ready to do battle as the as the as they did in race one. Now what I'm hoping for, Rob, is that uh, Ryan Walker doesn't have any problems going towards the grid and that he is able to at least make the most of uh, doing a grand job going forwards into possibly getting himself onto the podium, if not at least the top five finish. Because with the pace he's shown in qualifying so far, at least, he has the capability and I reckon he could do well, provided nothing goes wrong going to the grid. Yeah, I think the podium was really hard because these three guys ahead, they seem to be certainly uh, the fastest guys out there. Um, of course, we couldn't really see what Walker could have done, but I think that would be really tough to get, uh, you know, to beat them. But on the other hand, Butcher is actually splitting the walk racing duo this time. This is a brilliant opportunity for Paul Patrick, because this time maybe he doesn't have to work together with Camfield. Maybe Camfield will take some time to get past Butcher. Maybe he won't even do that at all. This could be a good chance for, for Patrick to catch up again. Certainly have to wait and see. Butcher, of course, will do everything he can, obviously starting from the front row to try and disrupt the championship battle and do everything in his path to try and allow Tarborg some kind of reconciliation for his results in race one, which only saw him quite finish, I believe it was seven, just behind Ossiclin, so he just yeah. missed out on the top six. Tarborg already but, lost the... Um, he's already down to third, even without a penalty in the points, only uh, because of his race one results, so... Certainly not looking good for Torg at the moment. Would it be safe to say that if he doesn't get a decent result in this second race, that is effectively his champion charge over because he didn't read, really, he wasn't even able to, de de to deliver enough points to keep himself in the lead. So, uh, would you say it's safe to assume that if he doesn't score a, a better result or at least try and overhaul the walk racing cars, which at the moment looks like an incredibly mammoth task to do, then would you agree with me by saying if he doesn't get a result, it's championship over for Talborg? No, I wouldn't. Because the Thrax and everything can happen, and one DNF is enough. You know, if Torg, you know, if Torg wins, it seems a bit unlikely with this pace at the moment. But if he wins, he can gain 30 points, and it's very easy to crash at Thraxen. You see a lot of drivers crashing at Thraxen. So, um, yeah, I think it's still, still a possibility for him. It's unlikely though, but maybe he won't have anything to lose in the final race. So, let's see how it goes. Well, if anyone can rise to the challenge, it's certainly going to be Jesper Tolbor. You never want to back down from a fight, if you've seen so far in championships gone by. And indeed, in this first race, we now have just 1 minute 40 seconds left in warm-up. Uh, Klaus Nearing currently top of those times. The only man to set a time, of course, so far. 115.590 gets immediately dissed by Peter Hennenberg. Uh, and for what you've seen, of course, in qualifying, again, Rob, is there anyone that's surprised that's pleasantly surprised you in qualifying going forwards? I mean, Haxon's uh, had a much better running qualifying from what I can see. He's now up there roughly inside the top 10. Uh, and again, Ryan Walker again impressing him fourth. So there's a couple of drivers up there who certainly made an impression. And again, it's the guys from Optin Sim Racing. They really know how to kind of mix it up the field. Which shows that they do have not only strength and strength in numbers, but also they're a very capable team all round. They've done some great work over the uh, the off season to uh, build upon their speed. Yep, great season so far from uh, from Optimum, and it's not it's certainly not a one off. It's been every round so far. Actually, can you check if Mate Orban is back in the server? It doesn't appear to be. He's only showing 18 cars in the server, so it looks like possibly Mate Orban is. 
is uh, either late back from qualifying or hasn't qualified at all and decided that he's going to just uh, g give it a miss for the rest of the day and uh, that's his race weekend over as the clock ticks down to less than 30 seconds might be internet we problems towards for race him. two might be internet problems for him because he just showed up as, uh, as a dnf so it might be a disconnect maybe doesn't have internet connection back for this race which is a shame because He's in a pretty good position in the championship, actually. And of course, now he's losing ground to all his rivals, to, to Henneberg, to Silva, to Verva, and so on. And that's never an easy situation, is it, Rob? Of course, when you're doing so well in the championship, in a race, or you're doing the best job you can, and all of a sudden you get that disconnect, and it's kind of like fate almost seems to go against you with that kind of thing, because you're just minding your own business, and all of a sudden technology decides that it wants to have a tantrum, and then unfortunately it's... Uh, can make a difference between finishing a racing and being game over straight away. Yeah, but this is like the when you do real racing and your car breaks down. There's also nothing you can do, but just sometimes it happens. And, uh, you know, it happens more often for some drivers. They've got a worse internet connection, but, I mean, Mark Webber's car also broke down much more often than Vettel's car last <laughs> season, for example. <laughs> so, I mean, that's just how it goes. There's nothing really you can do about it. Well, that's that's what some people say, anyway. <laughs> There are there are conspiracy theorists out there, and I'm not one of them, which suggests that uh, that uh, Mark Webber's car was uh, more unreliable than uh, than the vessels, but that it wasn't necessarily that much of a coincidence. But like I said, I'm not a believer of that. So, moving swiftly on, this is not Formula One. This is, of course, virtual minis, and we are getting set to go onto the formation lap for race number two, and indeed off we go. So. Grid as they form them for race number two is as follows. It is Paul Patrick once again on pole position, with this time Chris Butcher putting his THR red car onto the front row in car number five. He will start in second place. Adrian Camper will start in third position uh, for the second of the walk racing cars, with Ryan Walker this time has made the grid, so he will start from P4. So rejoice all Ryan Walker and Optimus Sim Racing fans. Your man in car 95 is going to be starting from fourth place. And he will hopefully get a good start and push on to try and get a decent result. Fifth is Diogo Silva for GT Competizione. Sixth, Gus Verver, much more improved from him as well. The, day, the uh, Dutchman will start in uh, sixth position with uh, Jonathan Osserklint in seventh, ahead of his uh, uh, one of his uh, rivals from that mid, mid pack scrap, Jesper Talborg in eighth. He needs all the points he can get to stop. Uh, Patrick and uh, Campford further running away with the title as they go towards the final round. Then with uh, Peter Hennenberg in ninth position, and Klaus Nearing rounds out the top ten. Yeah, Nearing and Hennenberg actually, they always seem to be in the same role, aren't they? You know, always together on track, it's kind of funny. Uh, well, in eleventh place, Ben Hexen for Optimism Racing, then twelfth, Tomasz Matusze Tomas Matuszewski. I never had so much trouble with his name. This is in TPS for a long time. Thirteenth, uh, Xavier de Cavallo. And then in 14th place, only in 14th place, Ryan Cullen. 15th place, Andy van der Felde, who seems to be struggling a little bit on this track, followed by Arachuk Rathalan. And then on the final row of the grid, John Monroe and Luis Fernandez. So an 18 car field will make their way back down towards the pit straight. Quite an intriguing uh, run here today, of course. This is a, a, a very, very short circuit, but it's one that certainly hasn't doesn't take liberties, especially if you use plenty of the, uh, the, 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 the the runoff areas or lack of runoff areas here and try to extend the track. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, there are no MSA track limit style things here, of course, but there are liberties that you can um, of, uh, take, uh, t t t exceed, shall we say. You see them too far and you'll find yourself with a rat of the stewards with a slap wrist. So, uh, hopefully these guys will respect them as much as they can and they won't be going away with any kind of trouble. All set then for another 20 laps of Cascavel. Is Patrick Butcher on the front row? How is the championship going to play out here by the end of the second race? We'll find out in a couple of moments' time. Racing and underway. Good start from Patrick. Covers across immediately for Butcher. They're all slotting in behind each other. Top three have got away in single file. Warcourser with a good start away up into fourth place and he will hold on to the top six or so. All holding line of sterns. They oh, Patrick. Turn one and Patrick already Butcher's wide. through. Butcher's, Butcher's through. Inside. Butcher straight away taking advantage of the mistake from Patrick. He did that so many times in the first race. Somebody went wide. It's one of the oh, Oscar Oscar Clint. Oscar goes wide onto the grass. The Swede is out wide and he has to let almost everyone through. Bounding along in car 93. Eventually gets it back onto the, onto the black stuff. But he's back down to last and he's 18th. So he's have to make it all up once again. That's the field winds his way through the first lap. But look at that. Butcher into the lead. Took full advantage because Patrick couldn't keep it on the road that much. And he's now, he's now through. But for how much longer will he keep in front? 
Patrick already attacking on the outside. He doesn't want to waste any time here. Oh, he gets a cutback. That's a great move from Patrick, if he can make it stick. Butcher holds on around the outside. Yeah, Butcher stays up front. But now uh, Patrick has a good run. Kenfield as well. Oh, and that was uh, Verva off the track there. They're at it again. They're at it again, <laughs> these three. It's Verva. It's Verva. And, um, no, he's nearing that last time, wasn't it? It's Talbork and Silver once again battling as Verva and Hennenberg getting involved also. And Klaus nearing and Ben Axel. So these guys have the pit straighten already. Silver using all the track and a little bit more. And they're almost going two by two. Hurrah down towards the first corner again. Look at the three walk racing cars. Hennenberg, Verva and Nearing as close as you like and it's now a walk who's heading in front of them as uh, we see Hennenberg go around the outside a little bit sideways there from Hennenberg as he holds on. Tarbog is down to six as Diogo Silva gets himself back in front and again the background is that one of the THR orange cars running a little bit wide I think that was possibly Moseski it was and he lets Amanda Bell through that bright blue rock out racing car as they're still going side by side under braking. Verva and Hennenberg swapping places into the right hand as they start to put the power down up the hill and Talbog now on the pick of Diogo Silva once again. These guys will still, will still want to leave each other alone as they uh, head back up towards the double left hander, which takes them back towards the pit straight. And that is is that uh, Haxon Lotti? He's at oh. sideways, and somehow he was missed by the tire foot. It looks like Monroe's gone around as well. Let's get a quick replay of what's happened here. That now, was a technical I, problem. I'm pretty sure. Well, let's take a look here then. So this is now this started as oh there, there you go. Look at that. And oh, that, oh I think that, that was probably a bit of a lag spike there, but. It seems a bit of a lag bubble, but I think there was a small bit of contact between the pair of them that obviously must have been uh, on one of their I think Monroe avoided them actually and just uh, lost the, the rear of his car when, when he avoided them, you know, because everything got unsettled. But uh, yeah, no problem, he's still going. Now Patrick has been caught by uh, by Camfield and Camfield certainly putting him under pressure. Butcher would be loving this. You know, he's in the lead of the race, great position for him. Well, he knows Maybe he can even break the draft. Well, he knows the harder that he can push, obviously, it's going to mean that he can possibly try to force these two guys to up their pace and run a little bit harder than they want to. But, of course, we know exactly how fast these, fast, can, fast these guys can go. They can turn up the wick if they have to. But now, it's all well and good for the front four, but I want to keep looking at the battle for fifth position because, once again, it is on between this pack. Look at the pack! Headed by Jesper Tolborg with Silver behind and Hennenberg, Verver, Nearing, Callan. Callan's up to 10th after qualifying back in 14th. Uh, four spots already, and looking for ninth place up the inside of his teammate. That's a daring move. He's up now to uh, no, he's down to eleventh. In fact, he's been passed by. Uh, that was Rad Razvan. Razvan's had a great run off the start of the grid. Look at the look at these guys. They said there's no entity rival, not between the two of them, but these four oh, guys have been the over each other. Back down the back straight. They're still once again side by side. It's now going to be uh, Raz Razvan. Yes. Uh, Razvan's got himself in front, so Razvan has got around Ryan Callan. Verva's around also, also Van der Bell is battling with uh, Little Luxus, that's uh, David de Carvalho and the sole Mad Kate racing car. They're also under attack by Luis Fernandez and Thomas Manizeski. So uh, this is a fantastic scrap battles all around. Someone's got making Oh, it someone's that. off. It's good. That's Verva. Verva's gone wide. The 86 car going over the uh, the over oh, the black and blue uh, black and blue uh, tarmac. And oh, Fernandez. That that's Fernandez. Gets shoved out wide onto the grass. Gets it back together again. Can these guys not keep it on the black stuff, Rob? Well, everyone's still going here, so no harm, no foul, I would say. But certainly they are battling hard, and Rasmus certainly seems to be the winner of the, you know, of the start of the race. He's in the top ten, in ninth position. That's very good. The back up hill once again. Very tricky braking zone again. It's looking up the inside. Is that uh, Hennenberg up the side of Silver? Indeed, it was. Portuguese man keeps the GT Competition only car in front, car 48, and of course Klaus Nearing is bringing along the CD mob from Walk Racing behind him because we've got Nearing Razvan, would you believe, in ninth place. What a run he's having in car 31, and then car 68, Ryan Callan with his uh, his typical Jacques Villeneuve helmets in the uh, the cockpit, so he's definitely uh, a fan. Camper with a, with a fast snap of the race, 114.501, who increased the pressure on teammate Paul Patrick in second place. Up again, only a tenth of a second, but there are only three tenths behind Butcher, who still leads this race at the front. Ryan Walker is a further two points, almost two and a half, between two and a half, three seconds back. And he's having to hold off the advance of Jesper Tolborg, with Diogo Silva also battling hard with Peter Hedenberg, and nearing Rasban and Callan, who's almost giving Rasban a shove through the corner, but he's almost oh, no. sideways, he's hit him! That is a disaster, Rasban goes off, oh, a huge incident! Huge, oh. crap again! He's oh, he lost the wheel. Rasping's 
but that did not go anywhere, anywhere far. So can we get a replay of this one as well? Abs absolutely. And let's have a look here. Now he got sideways already. Can we get the, the can we get the one from the from the rear wing looking back? Yeah, absolutely. Let's have a quick look and see exactly what happened. There. So we'll try and get a, a, a ideal view then. Let's have a look back. Now, this yeah, is the view we want to see. Now let's see the first part. Was there a touch? And well, he seems to lose it on his own, and Lost then Colin. Yeah. I'm not Ooh, sure, I don't that's think Cullen's really to blame for that, Russell's already sideways and of course, you know, Cullen is not really trying to hit the mallet, that's still a shame, you know, two walk racing teammates hitting each other. Oh! Miss this, look at that! Patrick's in front and Butcher's lost second place, he's under attack from Catfield. We'll get a replay of that in a second, but look at this, Catfield to the inside, so in the blink of an eye, Butcher goes from first to third and he's lost a couple of places, Patrick running a little bit sideways and Butcher won't give it up, but what on earth happened there? Yeah, let's see the replay of this one as well. We'll try and That was Cap Patrick simply driving look around the outside. Look at that for a pass from Paul Patrick. Straight around the outside. See you later, Butchie. I am off. And of course they're moving forwards. Of course then Patrick Butch had to get defensive. He comes down the, the back straight. He's tapping away in the rear bumper. They're so close between each other. Got to run up the inside, up into the final corner. But again, Patrick shuts the door. And then back onto the pitch that they're going through. And there's Hennenberg's out of the race. The Hennenberg is out of the race. He's just dropping down the order fast. So what's happened between him? Something's happened between this stop because Hennenberg is out of the race. He's dropped down the order like a stone. Let's have a look and see what's happened. Someone's off as well. That is... Uh, silver. Silver. And Silver and Hennenberg were together. So I... If that's going to tell us a story as to what happened... That's Ooh, he's way off. And on Hedeberg's hit the back of Silver under breaking. Oh, Peter, what was that all about? <laughs> That's a shame. Did he hit the wall as well? Oh, you can't see anything. I only see this red. Yeah, I think he did, yeah. But that, you have to admit, that was careless from Peter. He just left his break a little bit too late. I'm not sure really Silver was to blame for any of that, if I'm being perfectly honest looking at no, the No, I don't think view. so. No, because Silver held his line. Peter simply was a bit careless in holding it. In fact, Silver's actually out. He's lost it again, so... Lost Maybe you got a real accident. puncture or so. Meanwhile, Butcher's all over the back of uh, Camfield. Yeah, we'll quickly get a view of that as we quick look through. And here we go back down to the battle for second place. So, Pat, so Patrick now has uh, sprinted, tried to sprint away. Campfield is now almost kind of almost letting him go, sort of. But uh, Butcher's still keeping tabs on him in, in second place, in third position. Talbot up to four, which is certainly going to help him claw some points back from those he lost. But he is bringing Ryan Walker with him in fifth position. Nearing's into sixth. With Callan just ahead of Andy van der Velde in 8th. What a run from Andy van der Velde as well in the Rockout racing car. The bright blue car also in the back of your shot just behind. I think you'll just about see it. If you can, we look back very quickly. There it is. Yeah, and he's on the attack. Well, okay. not really. No, he's on the defense against uh, <laughs> Fernandez. But he's certainly not far behind Ryan Callan. Oh, they're all running a little bit wide there. But you don't really gain time if you run wide there. Because of the anti-cuts, you go over them and then you lose a bit of time again. So we'll look at, uh, obviously look at the fact we've got 15 cars still left in this race. We've lost Diogo Silva. Ooh, Peter Fernandez. Razvan, as Fernandez got himself up the inside of Vanderbilt. Oh, the great pass from him. Left it, but but Vanderbilt's not finished. He may get the undercut here if he's clever. But uh, couldn't get done that job. But he might have to sit back and think, well, maybe we'll live another day. As <laughs> Fernandez sideways. These cars love to go sideways. It's all. Oh, Fernandez had to really stamp on the anchors there to stop himself getting loose to hit in the back of Callum because he was so close to... But the car was moving around a lot in the braking zones. He was very careful to uh, get that car under control once again. But uh, now it's Fernandez on the attack on Callan. And Callan's not exactly willing to give up any position. We've seen that time and time again. So what has Fernandez got left in his arsenal? Try and make a move on the 68 machine of Ryan Callan as they come onto the back straight. So let's look at this pack as they come through. Then this Motley crew. It's Callan, Fernandez, Vanderveld, Di Carvalho. And Matazeski at the bottom of that pack with John Monroe, Osklint, Osklint, sorry, who's dropped back to 12th, and uh, 13th place for John Monroe. So they're all kind of in, in a nice tight group, battling for best of the rest in 7th. Uh, both uh, Callan and Fernandez using a lot of the exit curb and the runoff off the final corner. And down the pit straight they come. The gap is 3 tenths of a second as they charge into turn 1 once more. Callan holding that inside run. Fernandez running slightly, a little bit too deep, slightly too deep into that first corner. Just cost him a car length or so. And that puts him down to the clutches of Andy Vanderbilt once again. Now what's also intriguing if we skip back forwards again is that these two 
In fact, Cavwood's got through, sorry. Cavwood has got past Butcher, so whilst we were looking at that battle going on back... I think he was gonna... already ahead. I think he was already ahead. He got through uh, when Patrick passed him as well. Oh, yes. So Butcher's yes, now trying to get yeah. back into the second position. But it met my apologies for that, my goodness. And what looks oh, like a chance. For a cutback. Butcher up the inside for the cutback. Cavwood will sweep across the outside. It holds on for now. But the running might get off the corner because he did take the uh, the better line off for the cutback. This may work if you can get a good run, but then again, a good good run. Although that said, Catford has a slightly better measure down the down the straight the speed. So in terms of a straight line, unless you're really tucked up underneath in the toe, it doesn't, doesn't seem as though he's getting too much of an advantage. And uh, what's also intriguing me as well is how much Talbot's going to close in. Uh, as we now onto lap 10 of 20, so we're halfway through race two. And uh, running a grand job so far with Walker in fifth. We think we've had a change somewhere in the standing standings behind because that's updated yeah, somewhere. Yeah, Luis Fernandez actually. Oh, he he dropped back before and now he moved up again. Maybe he missed the sector split or so. Possibly. Not quite sure what happened there. It will be the case, and uh, they're still keeping line of stern. Close as you like, close as you like between the pair of them. And there's once more, just harrowing the back of Ryan Callan for seventh position. In the battle between 7th and 11th on your screen there, of course, it's Callan in the black and gold machine there in the front of the field. Then it's Luis Fernandez, the black and orange GT Competizione car, and Callan again holding the inside rubber moving across just a little bit to try and um, nullify the incentive that Fernandez might get up the inside, which he's trying to take oh. advantage of now. Bit of a cuts him off there, there a bit. And because of that, it's compromised his run. That gives an awesome opportunity. Anthony van der Velde to grab 8th position. He's slowly pulling alongside. The toe he'll get from Carvalho behind in terms of the draft might help a little bit. But van der Velde, what kind of run can he get? He's moving across. He might almost make contact with a pair of them. A great aerial shot to watch this battle going on. Back onto the pit strike using all the anti-cuts on the exit. And they're going to go side by side again. And Carvalho might even make it three wide if they're not too careful. They're heading down. They're charging down towards turn one. Back up under brakes. And there oh, comes Matryoshevsky. Matryoshevsky from nowhere. Carvalho gives him room. Someone's gone off wide. Oh, Callum's Callum, run. Callum runs wide at turn one. Callum has run wide. Maybe. Oh, where can you, no, can you he re-enter the track? He, he does reappear at the back of the pack. Well, almost because almost it moves through. And in the and incredibly, we'll get a quick... Oh, Van der Velde. How did he catch that? Well, obviously, it's a front-wheel drive car, so you boot the throttle. But that's incredible car control for Van der Velde. And he's come out on top. <laughs> I don't, I don't get that. Can we see that again? In that <laughs> corner, you know, even when you lose it, it's not... There was a touch of Fernandez. Oh, Whoa, sideways <laughs> stuff from Vanderveld. Grab that one back again, Sonny Jim. That's a fantastic <laughs> job from Andy Vanderveld to hold on to seventh place. That's been one of the best car pieces of car control we've seen all season, hasn't it, Rob? Yeah, and at this corner, I mean, in front-wheel drive, it's, of course, easier to save slides than in rear-wheel drive. And that corner with the elevation change and everything, and the corner, and then there's the next bit, you know, it's really hard to catch the car once you're sideways. And we... Oh, Fernandez! Oh! oh. I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that uh, Van der Velde was... That Fernandez was too impressed by that car control from Fernandez. He kind of thought, damn it, got him once, he didn't, he didn't spin off. I'll try I it think, again. I think Fernandez actually uh, flashed the slides afterwards, you know, to say sorry. So he probably realized that was a oh. bit too aggressive, but uh, Fernandez certainly looks racy. Fernandez looks like he has the fastest car out of these. What's intriguing also, I'm wondering what, Cal what part Callan still has to play in this. He's back in 12th. He may just be sitting back here thinking, okay, let's not rush it too fast. Oh, f now Fernandez has dropped a... That's probably a time. Oh, oh, oh. Constantino effect. Oscar got, into the, Oscar got into the back of De Carvalho. You hit the back of Manizewski. And they're all pointing in a straight line. These guys are mental. Yeah, it's... Uh... It's just crazy. It's just like in the first race, now only it's even more cars in the battle. Oh, a bit of contact there from uh, De Cavallo. Nothing too big. No Ryan on the inside of Ocker Clint. Contact Morning again, station. but nothing. No problem at all there. And a little bit wide there also for I saw in front from Fernandez as he continues to chase uh, Vanderbilt for 7th place. That's, this is, has to be Vanderbilt's best run of the season up in 7th position. A great run so far. They head back through. Now Callan's trying to look for any way on the inside through the final corner. They're all kicking up dust. Oh, Callan, Callan entered bit. the corner a bit too far on the inside, I think, and just run wide on the exit. And that's intriguing because he, he kind of gained a bit of an advantage by holding in front of John Monroe. Ah, I don't, think he, Monroe. don't think he did. Well, that, oh, that's it. Monroe has got to look up the inside and he has made the path past stick. Or has he? Because Callan's now going to get himself back up on the inside to get the cut back that he needs. Monroe just Ooh. keeps it on the road. 
without, hit, hit, without touching the curve, and Callan is back up into 12th position. So, a good run so far from these two as they head forwards, as they now progress towards, I think it's now lap, it's now lap, of course it is lap 13. Callan leaves the door open on the exit of the right-hander, as they're now going to go side to side again. And Callan will have his nose just about in front, but Munro won't give it up that easy. You know, tenacious, tenacious this young Scotsman is, like a, like a determined terrier dog holding onto someone's leg. He won't let go of that position if he, if, he, if he can afford it. He goes back up the inside. Can he get another run this time? No, Callan shuts the door and he get, he's going to carry on to hold on for the, as much as he can. Quick check up at the back, up at the battle for the front. Paul Patrick is, is now pulled out an advantage of 1.7 seconds over Campford. He's got a, a further four tenths gap on to Chris, to Chris Butcher in third place. That's again the fight for seventh place continues. And look at this fantastic pack that's all battling away. We've got Vanderbilt pulling away. Fernandez now looking to an in, onto the inside runs. De Carvalho did get through. Fernandez looking against the inside. These GT Comp tits the only cars that are very daring under brakes into turn one. Carvalho will almost get hung out to dry if he's not too careful. And almost might even let Mazdesky up the inside. And he is doing because here comes the THR Orange driver. We've got the run. Oh, Oscar Oscar's wide. So is wide as well. Got, they're both off onto the grass. And so, so is Ben Haxon. I think you'll find it's the black stuff. Stop kicking up red all the dirt everywhere. No one can see. Oh, so who was that? That's that's, that's Callan. Ryan Callan's off. Ryan Callan oh. has been thrown off into the scenery, and we've got to get a replay. What happened here? Round the outside. Oh, oh there was a touch between Monroe and Callan. Oh, now that's tough to call. I think. I think that's just a racing oh. incident. I think now, they just tried to go through the corner, and I mean Monroe's on the outside. The chase, He's Callan's, Callan's re entering the track. Monroe's just going on the outside. And Let's look here. Uh, you know, he's not even fully sticking to the inside there, so mm, I, I, I don't think Monroe's to blame. No, I, I have to admit, I, I have to agree with you on that one. I don't really think so. I think really that was kind of more Callan losing it himself. He's out, unfortunately. Yeah, that's that's a shame. So Ryan Callan will not take any further part, and he is out of the race. Uh, well, after what could have been a solid top 10 finish, but unfortunately, it is not to be this afternoon. And look at these guys, they're still going at it. Uh, oh, there's uh, Fernandez. Fernandez, is Fernandez, is... Fernandez has dropped back, so something's happened to Fernandez. Meanwhile, oh, no! Oh, that? Monroe! He's dropping side sideways. He's kept it under control. Di Carvalho sideways also as he gets a tag from Osaklin. As uh, now it's Di Carvalho challenging Madazeski now for 8th uh, position. And what can the, the, the South African do? Back up the inside. Here comes Osaklin trying to make a move also in the 93 some of the exit curb to keep the car on the road and Carvalho is, is literally pushing Manizeski at this rate, he's looking to the outside now, back to the inside oh this could be a fantastic dummy if he pulls it off Manizeski holding the line is he going to be forced wide a little bit Yeah, he does give Carvalho some room but not enough that it gives him a chance up the inside and he will hold on for the moment and again look at Manizeski, he's having to just move oh. across, forcing Xavier to cut to back out, I'm sure Xavier's thinking come on Thomas, give be fair Give me some room here. I'm trying to get past and uh, race cleanly here. Let's uh, let's all be friendly about this. Oh, oh he goes no, a bit I into the that. back of Tosh. But nah. this gives Ockerklin the run. Oh, and look at Oscar. Now that, that, that nudge he got in the final corner, that must have pushed Mazeski wide. And as a result of that, Cavalier checked up and that put Oscar onto his rear end to possibly get a run onto the pit straight. So, Monroe's recovered. Oh, Ooh, he's a bit uh, of lag. Oh, no. He's side with someone else is on How the back he... of the front one as well. <sighs> And who was, that was that so rejoining? close. Was, that, was it Vanderveld who went wide? I anyway. don't know. Vanderveld still seems to be let's, ahead let's of the group. Let's have a quick look here. Uh, it was oh, Vanderveld. Yeah. Kicked up the dust. Oh, just a bit of lag. Yeah, I think we lag. just had a... so That was okay. That's not too bad from uh, Vanderveld. He's carrying on his seventh place. Rather quietly in seventh place, actually. He's pulled away from the pack and he's uh, having a great run. And actually, I should be right in saying, Rob, this, I believe, will be his best finish of the season because seventh place, credit where credit's due, in a single man team, that's a great effort. Yeah, I think in the last uh, Clio race also he finished 6th, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, yeah, he's certainly improving. And he didn't really seem to be on the pace when you look at his qualifying results, but he just did everything right, stayed out of trouble in the races, and yeah, gets rewarded. But back onto the pit straight once again. Baffa continues to rage on between four cars at the front here. In, in, in the mid pack, I should say. There's Vanderbilt, who's 7th, he's pulled away. Matazeski, 8th. Ossiklin, 9th. Di Carvalho is 10th and Luis Fernandez rounding out 11th place position with only John Monroe, Gus Verber and Ben Haxon left in this race. So only 14 cars remain in this uh, in this event. 
Now remains to be seen exactly how it's going to work. It's all oh, Fernandez. All sideways action. Fernandez has lost it completely. And again, it, 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 these guys are just uh, just been so thankful for that tarmac runoff because if they hadn't, they'd be spearing straight off into the tyres, and that would be certainly game over. We'd have seen that happen so many times for certain races, so I'm so pretty sure they're thankful that the tarmac's there because the they're still on the track and still racing. Yeah, there's been lots of drivers who've been making mistakes there in this race. I'm a bit amazed, you know. I'm amazed that they all made these mistakes and also that they're all still going. But I think awesome. no one really crashed in this in this corner. They all just went wide and re-entered the track again and kept going. The Clint's getting a run on De Carvalho up the inside. And again, these cars are great for side-by-side -side racing on multiple corners. And Carvalho gets the elbow from Oscar Clint saying, get out of it. But he can't get it done just yet. And they're going to run side-by-side -side once more. I wonder just how much... Uh, Oscliff will put up with before he has to capitulate uh, eighth posi ninth position. And you just have to. Although, <laughs> credit where credit's due, they've stayed side by side through the final corner. But I feel that the run that Oscliff got was much better than Ducker Values. It's being proved because he is keeping his nose in front. He will have the advantage down towards turn one. He does keep his nose in front. So, Ducker Value pushing hard. But I think he'll be happy with the top ten. But also, bear in mind also that. Uh, John Monroe is, is making advances in 11th oh. place, and Delco Valley is onto the grass, and when they get oh, no. completely he's off! Oh, oh it's... Hit oh, huge, huge... Hit. How lucky was, uh, was Fernandez there? Let's, let's, let's look, at the, look, look at the replay here, and just it simply just driver error, runs off himself onto the grass, gets it sideways, it, it just snaps, hits the bar, a huge impact, and whoa! Luis Fernandez has to, must, have, must have had his heart in his mouth, because he was so close to being collected there by, mad, by the Mad Kate Rake driver. He is carrying on, but uh, unfortunately that's uh, the end of his race for the moment, at least I feel. So that's not exactly that one that he'll remember for a long time. Yeah, um, I think he just tried to correct a little bit too much while he was on the grass, and because the grass is very bumpy here on this track, so um, you have to keep the throttle straight and you know just hope that you don't hit anything. And he just maybe tried to correct it a little bit too much and just unsettled his cars and he snapped, went into the barrier and flew back across the track. And he, yeah, Fernandes was really lucky that he didn't get hit there. It almost seems like Butcher is back, um, right behind the uh, campfield. Be an intriguing battle to watch them with two that we just uh, a, lap and a lap and a half to go. Patrick still has that advantage, he has led practically all race after he's managed to snatch the lead. Uh, in the early laps from uh, Chris Butcher, who now finds himself on the back of Campfield, hasn't been able to find exactly the same pace that he had in race one to uh, to at least hold the fr hold the front line. But it does show at least that I think on overall race pace, Patrick was faster. If he if he hadn't have been, then he if, it, then if he hadn't have been, he wouldn't have been pressuring uh, Campfield as he would have been. So final lap then, and one more chance for Chris Butcher. Make a move on Campfield to try and grab himself second place and his second podium of the, of the race of, of the race weekend. Got third. He'd love to get. Got third, but he'd love to go one better. Grab a second place if the opportunity presents itself, and we'll find out exactly if it does on this lap. So carrying on where where we left off at the end of that first end of that lap. It's Which now. Just close, but where does he really have the opportunity? He didn't do it into into turn one with the cutback or so. So um, yeah, it's hard. He probably has to do it in the in the double left hander section that he's coming up to now. But he didn't really get a good run out of the corner because he was a bit too early on the throttle and just tapped the back of um, Campfield's car. So he can't stick it on on the inside. He needs to try to get a cut back here, but Campfield just seems to be too good through the corner. And I think just running out of opportunities. Last corner is really tough to pass in. Oh, it's all, it's all, it is going to be the all-important run that he gets down the back straight. He will be in the toes. So whether or not he can pull himself alongside remains to be seen. I think he may have run out of opportunities unless something happens. Oh no, he goes for it. He goes for it. The final corner. And they ah. almost touched and Campbell stows in front. But Paul Patrick will hold on. Oh, Canfield so, runs wide. He runs wide, oh, but he has enough. to hold for second place. Patrick takes win number six of the, of the championship to retain his championship position. Catfall gets second and Butcher grabbing onto third just with Tolborg in fourth. Ryan Walker scores a well deserved fifth after his troubles in race one. Nearing sixth. Van Andy van der Velde, what a result for seventh place from Rocket. They're going to be happy with that. And Manazewski gets eighth. And Osserklip ninth. Monroe tenth. And Fernandez eleventh. Gustav Elver down to twelfth. 
Paxson 13th, De Cavalier will come through to finish 14th. Sands the front bumper after his excursion in the last couple of laps. He'll be glad just to finish this race in 14th. And that is it. We only have 14 cars finish the race out of 18 that started. So we lost drivers like Ryan Callan and uh, I think Diogo Silva as well. Yes, Diogo Silva. Uh, and also Peter Hedenberg and Matty Orban. No, Matt, we lost Matty Orban before anyway. Uh, there's, you have to check. You have to fill me in on that one, um, Rob, because I think we've missed out one more driver that we had retire um, fairly early on. Did we have Rasman? Uh, did you say Rasman? I, I, I think we did have Rasman. Thank you. Yeah, I think we did. Yeah, yes, we did. You had Rasman. So Rasman didn't finish either. So that's rather important for him. In fact, yes, because he had that off after he was uh, lost it himself through turn two and then got tapped from Alan as a result. So that's rather unfortunate for him. But there's the final results then for race two. It's Paul Patrick who takes another victory. He's sixth of the season, as we said, and of course he will then move forwards. To uh, carry on his advantage in the championship, Ken Asian Capital has to settle for second place, making it another walk racing one two with a TR THR Red three four. Chris Butcher ahead of Jesper Tolborg. Ryan Walker finishes fifth with Klaus nearing sixth, with Andy van der Velde, Thomas Madzeski, Jordan Osten Osten, and John Munro rounding out the top ten. We're going to get the drivers in for some interviews, so stay with us for a couple of for a couple of moments. Where we give thanks to our partners at Inside Team Racing. We'll be back to get all the feet fall out from race one and two, and interviews with the main protagonists from this race. Back in two. Inside SimRacing.tv, the fastest show on the internet. Sim racing news and reviews since 2007, with new shows every week. So, welcome back to the driver interviews for uh, round four, uh, round five, I should say, my apologies, round five of the 2014 Touring Pro Series Virtual Mini Challenge here at Cascavel. It's two fantastic races across the board. Of course, it was wins for uh, walk racing once again, Adrian Campford and Paul Patrick. Of course, on the screen, as you can see, if you want to keep up to date with all the happenings that's going on throughout the leagues, it's touringproseries.com for all the info. Of course, we have our TPS rankings and our TPS Hall of Fame, so you can see who are, who are and who have been the best drivers in TPS history, both past and present. Also, we're present on social media as usual, facebook.com forward slash touring pro series, twitter.com with our um, our tag is at, or our, our, our tag on Twitter is um, at touring underscore pro. And of course, if you missed any of this broadcast, or any going forwards or ones before, you think, I missed that broadcast, I, I, I love that broadcast, but I can't find it anyway. No, don't fret. Head to youtube.com forward slash touring pro series. So hit, hit the subscribe button. It takes literally two seconds. It is free. And of course, you can keep up to date with every single race weekend that we've done uh, back in full. You can enjoy it at your leisure. And of course, we give thanks to, of course, to Inside Sim Racing TV, Live Races, uh, SimSync Pro, Multi BC, Cancer Research UK, and of course, Rights to Studios for producing the fantastic sim that is GameScots.com 2013. And of course, all of you for watching. Right. Drivers are now in. We've been invaded once, as we normally have to do get into the race by several drivers. So, of course, including our main protagonists. So, we'll have a quick chat to a few of them. And we'll start off with the man who got uh, two pole positions and victory in race number two. And that is, of course, Paul Patrick. So, we're a little bit pressed for time. So, we're going to try and get these interviews to about two, about two or three questions uh, per driver to keep it a bit short because we are pressed a little bit for time. So, Paul, of course, uh, great start for you for the. So, Paul, uh, first of all, um, Two pole positions and, of course, a race victory. Uh, but in that first race, uh, you had a good advantage, but then Aiden just, Aiden just got past you. Um, but, of course, you sat behind it for quite a while. Was that a plan from the team to keep it steady, or were you just not able to challenge properly? Yeah, we was just going to take one apiece um, and just get some points back on Tolberg. I mean, Aiden was really quick anyway, um, even in his own. So, um, we was just, was just going to take right, a race win each, right? The intriguing thing is now, of course, you've taken a win apiece, and uh, we haven't had the, haven't got the updated driver standings just yet. But of course, it means it's going to be incredibly close between the pair of you going to Thruxton. So, what kind of approach are you going to be? Are you both going to be taking when it comes to the final round in a couple of weeks' time in Thruxton? Is it going to be the case of whoever's in front takes the victory, or is it going to be gloves off but in a clean and fair manner? Yeah, no, we're going to we're obviously going to race right because we both want to win. But obviously, we've got a team job to do as well. Um, 
but it's always clean and fair anyway, like at the front. It's good to see Chris back as well as another good good driver at the front. So um, we'll see how it goes. And finally, of course, the pace that you showed across the whole weekend, it's got to give you confidence to, uh, sit, to going towards Thruxton that you can possibly wrap up your first TPS championship. Does that does the result here this weekend mean that it feel, feel, make you feel that you've got a decent chance of taking the championship? Not really, because I wasn't that fast. I don't know how I'd, I'd done the pole lap in the first one. It was just, I was just fluked it, I think. I was really struggling. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, Adrian had like half a tenth for me probably, and then obviously Chris was there. So, um, hopefully he'll do the next race as well. Well, fingers crossed and best of luck to you, of course. So, uh, hopefully you can take it. the challenge. So, uh, great job, and hopefully we'll see you back in Thruxton. Uh, so, that's one half of the championship contenders. Of course, I believe, Rob, you've got the other one in Adrian Campbell. Yeah, Adrian, great result from you today. One win and one second place, and you're back in the championship lead. So how was that for you? Yeah, that was the main aim this week, so, uh, just to get back in the championship. Um, obviously, after the disaster of last last race. Um, but yeah, I'm really, I don't I don't even know where Talberg finished in the second one. Where did he finish in that one? He finished fourth. Okay, so still good points on him. So good, yeah. Yeah, so only one round left at Thraxton, and um, yeah, you're going into the round as a favourite now, so what do you think you can do in this round? I think just the same as always, uh, obviously me and Paul are going to have to battle a bit on this one in the last one, so um, it's been nice to see Chris back up there again, I wish he'd been there all season really, um, it would have been a lot more enjoyable, that second race was really close, and uh, I'm glad to see him back, um, I just want to say thanks to Walk Racing again. All right, well, well done, and good luck in the final round. Thank you. And back to Scott. Yeah, we're going to have a chat with uh, the man who uh, was up there, finished on the podium uh, alongside the two walk racing guys in both races. It is, of course, Chris Butcher. Chris, it's been a while since we saw you, but good to have you back in the, uh, in, the in the VMC paddock. And, of course, uh, not, a bad, not a bad way to come back. Uh, a front row start on two podiums. Got to be fairly pleased with that, haven't you? Yeah, not a bad result considering I missed two rounds of the championship. We're a little bit rusty going into this one. And to be honest with you, I only had about an hour's practice. So um, nice to be up there right at the front with, with the Watt Racing duo. And um, I'm hoping that I can repeat that at Thruxton. Maybe put a bit more practice in this time and um, maybe snatch a, a couple of wins from them. Now, of course, I'm presuming that obviously going into the final round at Thruxton, of course, then you kind of know what role you'll have to play uh, to try and help Jesper win the championship, of course. But, I mean, obviously, you've, you've been in a in situation before when, obviously, you've had um, you've had, you've, you've had to re- drive it. You know, you've been in a championship fight and someone's helped you out. So, of course, I'm pretty sure you're prepared to do the same return to help Jesper to try and fight for the championship. I guess that is the aim to help, help him secure the title and get another title back to THR. Um, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a team game at the end of the day. And, um, obviously, I'm, I'm not in the championship hunt. Jesper still is. So, um, I'll do whatever I can to to help him with that. Um, I mean, obviously, if there's if there's no chance of him winning it, then I'll I'll go for the race wins. But if he's if he's up there at the front, then I'll I'll do everything I can to get him into the lead of the race and hopefully the championship. And just quickly, of course, Thruxton is a circuit that's uh, quite synonymous with TPS. I mean, obviously, so obviously, depending on what happens in a championship hunt, of course, whatever happens, of course, you'll you said you're trying to help yes as much as you can. But you know, as you said, to take a race win at Thruxton, I think that's one that everyone wants to win, isn't it? Oh yeah, I mean uh, Thruxton was was where I won my first ever race in TPS, and um, statistically it's been quite a strong track for THR as well. Um, but the, the racing there is going to be going to be close. It's you know it's it's going to be flat out pretty much all the way around the lap. There's um, not going to be much in it. Um, yeah, ev- everyone's going to want to win that race, especially with it being the last round of the season as well, and everybody just wants to show what they can do really. Well, good to see you back, and well done for the two podiums. And fingers crossed, we'll be able to see you back up there again in Thruxton, and. Uh... Obviously, whatever happens with the championship height, I'm sure you'll be up there giving some of the uh, championship protagonists some trouble. But for the moment, well done, Chris. Good to see you back in two good podiums. Solid job. Thanks very much. And uh, just quickly, I think we've got time for one more interview, Rob. So um, over to you. Yeah, I would like to talk to Ryan Walker. And uh, first of all, the question, what happened in the first race? Uh, I went uh, I went to press my race button and then all of a sudden my uh, game froze for five or ten seconds and by the but uh, but on freeze, I I I ran out of time to get on the grid. So yeah, that was a uh, bad luck. That's a shame because your qualifying they were really excellent in this round, and it looked like in the second race you could you could finally show what you can do in these cars with a top five finish. 
Yeah, I'm really happy with P5 and race two, considering the the bad luck in race one, but the qualifying two and race two more than made up for it, and I'm happy with P5 and even more happy to be up there fighting against the like uh, the teams of uh, Walk Racing and THR. So only one round left. So I just would like to ask you, what was your impression of the season so far? Uh, I've, it's been good so far. I'm, I've enjoyed it. I mean, I've not had the uh, the good luck sometimes, but uh, when it's went, when I've had the good luck, it's it's went well, and it's uh, I've been right up there in the top ten. So hopefully, Fruxton, I can finish in the top ten in both races, and hopefully, if uh, all goes well, finish in the top ten in the championship. All right. Well, um, congrats on your results today, and good luck for Thraxton. Thank you very much. And I think that's it for the interviews. Yeah, obviously we're a little bit pressed for time, so of course it's uh, well done to everyone who took part in, this, in both this evening's races. The course, well done to our, t- our podium finishes in both races, uh, in no particular order. Of course, Paul Patrick, Adrian Campfield, and Chris Butcher. Good to see all three of them up on the standings and get some great results. So that means now we just have one more race event left to go, and that is, of course, the big one. It is the duel in the crown of any TPS championship alongside Bathurst and the likes of Bathurst of Mid-Ohio. It is, of course, Thruxton, the one that everyone wants to win, especially in the Clios. How prestigious is it going to be at the wheel of a mini? We'll have to find out in a couple of weeks' time. Of course, in the meantime, of course, if you fancy a bit of historic racing action, of course, then you can head over to check out this. This is the, of course, as we said, the Virtual Touring Masters Classic. Of course, champion that takes us back to the days of the Virtual Touring Masters back in Season 2 with the awesome Touring Car Legends mod that is making a reappearance once again by popular demand. And, of course, we visit some fantastic circuits such as Spa, Suzuka, Laguna Seca, uh, Salzburg Ring, Brands Hatch, and the big one that is Mount Panorama. You can even see, of course, on the right of your screen as we've shown you, it's a circuit which Toby Davis has fallen foul at three times at the very same corner. Uh, such uh, so many times effectively we decided we'd affectionately name a corner after him so it is never Davis S's where we've seen him fall foul I wonder possibly if that's going to be a blessing or a curse that's going to live with him for the whole season we'll have to find out if you want to take part of course you can head over to our forums at InsideTeamRacing.tv we have over 40 drivers signed up already so get yourself signed up very quickly because I'm pretty sure that the grids are not going to be able to hold 40 plus drivers these guys may possibly have to pre-qualify there may even be two divisions so if you want to get into the top split you're going to have to act fast and get yourself signed up over at InsideTeamRacing.tv that's where our forums are signups end on Thursday the 19th of this month so get over next Thursday is when that will happen uh, and of course going forwards first race starts on Wednesday the 25th of June, of June so you'll be able to see that one going forwards now just quickly before we wrap up then we do have the championship standings updated and we'll show you them thusly so this is how the championship stands then going forwards into the final round you, you guys can, on screen can see it but these guys who are in the chat who are listening can't just yet. So, of course, for especially for Adrian and Paul who are listening, this is how these guys stand going to the championship. So, Hampfield now leads the championship with 239 points. Patrick is now second with 233. And Talborg is third with 228 points. There are 11 points separating the top three going to the final two races at Thruxton. So, one bad result for either of these three could decide it. So which way it swings? Will it go to Campfield, Patrick or Tolborg if he can find any more pace? We'll have to wait and see. Uh, so the final round, of course, will be in a couple of weeks' time on June the 24th. For a quick heads up, I won't be here because I'll be out of the country uh, in Ibiza. So I won't be here to commentate. So I think it will possibly be uh, either Rob will be commentating solo, I think, or maybe we might get Lewis McLeod in, possibly, if he's available. But either way, the final race, race of the season will be covered as best we can. But uh, there is the team standings on the screen. But Rob, final thoughts, two crazy races, Cascava once again delivered. It's a circuit that you know is quite fast and frantic and once again lived up to its reputation. Yeah, it was a bit more crazy than I expected it to be, to be honest. Uh, lots of great battles, especially in the midfield. Um, at the front, it stayed calm, but you know, when th- we saw some great moves as well. We saw the pass from Patrick on Butcher, that was really a great move. And um, everything stayed relatively clean and now it's only one race left. Uh, I think it might be the final race with these minis as well. I'm not entirely sure on that one. But uh, certainly a race with a lot of prestige and everyone wants to wants to do well there. And of course, these three drivers, they all want to win the championship as well. So we'll see how it goes. Certainly will indeed. Hope you, hope you guys will join us for that season finale. It is a three-way scrap going into the final round. Who is going to take the title and the honour of VMC 2014 champion? Stay tuned in a couple of weeks' time at Thruxton. But for myself, Scott Woodris, and for Robert Beeson, we'll thank you all so much for watching. And we'll catch you for the final rounds in a couple of weeks' time. But until then, take care, and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.
Inside SimRacing.tv, the fastest show on the internet. Sim racing news and reviews since 2007, with new shows every week.